justifies. I like reading the, I, I have to read these Nietzsche pages in Heidegger about sometimes four or five times. And, you know, I, today I did read, um, well, first. All right. Uh, okay. Go, go ahead, Joe. Okay. So uh, I started off in a dutiful reading two or three pages a, a day. But then I realized that that defeats my purpose because the concepts are so complex and the way in which he introduces them and his long, long sentences with the verbs at the end, I've noticed. Yes. Uh, even though they're translated into English, uh, more or less. <laughs> uh, so I have to go back and read it more than once. And I have to read, uh, you know, a span of pages, like eight or nine, a sole section if possible. Yes. So uh, I, I logged down about page 135. And so I said, well, I'm not going to go to class uh, ignorant. So I jumped ahead to the very last page and I read the last uh, two or three paragraphs to see if they made sense. And they made perfect sense. And then I was able to read the paragraphs immediately before this. And then I saw the reference to the two times that uh, Nietzsche actually mentioned the word justice in his earlier but unpublished yep. essays. And so I went and read all about them. And I was getting interesting, uh, you know, finally getting my handle around what this, this justice thing was, because I couldn't figure out why justice even fits. You know, he's got, a, he's got five principles of, of metaphysics, I think, and uh, justice is, is uh, one of them. And Nietzsche, of course, picks will to power. And, and I think one question here is, why didn't he pick justice instead? I, well, I'm, I'm summarizing this loosely, but nevertheless. So why not just uh, forget about the, the justice thing and look at the rest of them as a unity? Are we just playing with words here because we have to use it? It's one of the five? Um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, first of all, it is definitely Heidegger who is the person who brought out this emphasis of uh, the notion of justice in Nietzsche, right? So um, uh, it wasn't something that previous commentators had focused on. Uh, once it's pointed out, you can see signs of it back as early as um, untimely meditations in Nietzsche. Um, and there's, there are, you know, I think he's onto something is what I'm trying to say, but it's definitely Heidegger himself who's highlighting this. Um, and uh, Heidegger, when Heidegger is trying to claim that justice is how truth appears to uh, mature Nietzsche, right? He's definitely making a claim which is outside the text about it, right? Uh, and he's trying totally, to- And totally confusing, <laughs> totally confusing. Uh... I mean, almost the words are just wordplay. I, I really find it really hard to figure out what he's trying well, to say. We'll, we'll definitely get to that. We'll definitely get to that. Um, but uh, uh, the, the German word is something more like um, um, righteousness or right making. Rectitude? Um, not quite no, rectitude. No, rectite. Uh, rectite. It, it's, it, it is rectite, uh, rectite but it, it, it's. Um, it's 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 something like right makingness, right? Um, Rick <laughs> and and uh, uh, so the 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 making right of things is uh, is kind of the um, as a actively done thing is the uh, the German concept, right? Um, but we'll 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 talk about why uh, he he thinks that that's. Um, a key, a key thing in Nietzsche. But fun, fundamentally, just briefly, what's going on there is um, Nietzsche starts with a notion of truth, which is kind of a relatively shallow notion of truth that sees it as being like correspondence representation. And from that point of view, he calls that notion of truth uh, the kind of error without which uh, a certain kind of uh, living thing could not live, right? So he's defining truth as error. Is that right? like Ibsen's life lie in the, in the Wild Duck play? Uh, Perhaps, but I, I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think that helps. I mean, the, the the more basic way of putting it is he he wants to see um, uh, understanding of the world as a function of the living organism, right? And understanding the world as a function of the living organism always falsifies the world for the uh, because it projects it onto the purposes of that organism, and in that sense, it is always an error. Um, mm -hmm. but it is an error with a utility for that mm -hmm. creature, right? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. in that sense, he wants to say that truth is error. Um, yeah, I like, uh, but the, I like that. And there's, and there's something paradoxical about that. The, the point that Heidegger is making is that there is behind that some notion of truth as correctness that is still important for Nietzsche. And the, um, uh, the in a way, calling truth error is saying that something like the purposes of the organism are a higher court of appeal than just being uh, a completely accurate picture of the external reality, 
right? So then the question is, what's the highest court of appeal? And the answer that uh, Heidegger arrives at is this uh, right-making notion of justice um, is the highest court of appeal. N Nietzsche uh, creates a kind of hierarchy where the the where truth is lower than art, art is above it, but there's something which is above even art, which is something like uh, the way in which um, the legislative will uses both art and truth for its uh, for the construction of the human world, something like that. Um, and that's what he means by justice. Um, it's the it's the constructive legislative will um, underlying the use of both art and knowledge, um, where art is understood as not trying to understand the world, but trying to uh, uh, transform it um, uh, to change it. So what happens, um, what happens if you negate the word and use the word injustice? Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there, there, there are many things that could possibly be injustice and only a few things which are justice, right? Uh, so there's lots of ways in which something could be, uh, it failed to meet the definition of justice, so, so categorized, but uh, one of which would be to say that truth is worth more than art, and another of which would be to say that uh, um, accurate uh, adequation to external reality is more important than your own purposes, and so on, right? There, there, there's, there's, there's lots of ways in which this structure um, could be upset or returned because it's a it's a it's a total structure. But um, we'll we'll get to that when we get to chapter six. Um, I just wanted to sketch out a little bit about why it's not completely crazy that he's uh, calling us the concept of justice, and he is erecting it on things that Nietzsche himself says. It's just seeing how central it is is something that Heidegger himself is bringing to the uh, bringing to the topic uh, that Nietzsche himself you know did not you know directly say or insist upon. Um, Okay. Uh, can can so I ask a question? For, uh, yes, go. Can I ask a question on that? Um, so I, I'm not clear. I didn't read, so you know, I apologize. Just dismiss it if I'm asking a dumb question. But I'm not. It's not clear to me. Um, his notion of justice is this highest sort of concept, this highest priority we can have. But isn't that going to entail all kinds of ideas that that are considered to be true ideas that inform what justice means to us. Um, par, par, and uh, so I don't, par, I don't par, really- partly, par, partly, but not simply, right? Um, so the, the, the fundamental character of the kind of truth that's involved in justice is not correspondence to an external reality. It is, um, it is fiat creation of what reality shall be. So there's a power aspect to it that is a, also a creative aspect to it that is also a Why free those, aspect you, to it. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, that that's a interesting take. I don't see how that's mutually exclusive with the idea of a uh, there also being a correspondence idea of truth. Uh, it's it's so not in other words, it's not, a, it's not an exclusion. It's a subordination, right? Um, so the 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 claim is that uh, to mature Nietzsche, it is more important what you determine should exist and therefore create and make exist than it is what you think exists already, right? Okay, so that, but that valuation of saying, I think this is better than that, that Absolutely. is taken as a type of, of truth about some kind of, of, uh, of statement not, about- Not simply, not simply of, of truth, but exactly in the sense that it is being posited, exactly in the hierarchy of being, being posited, it is a pure example of willing something to be. Um, we, we'll, we'll get there, but I mean, the, the, it, it's not, it's not uh, oh. more in correspondence with, a, uh, uh, with some external standard of the, of the natural hierarchy of these three things. Right, I mean, it, would, it would be an internal standard, I guess, but, but still it's corresponding with something that's taken to be true. At least that's how it, I don't see how no, you can get no, away from that. No, from you're that. wrong, you're wrong. So the, 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 you have to, you're, you're still trying to understand Nietzsche from a previous metaphysics, right? Instead of hearing what he's saying that's distinct, right? The, the, in his own language, uh, 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 these, these, are, these are things which are acts, not perceptions. They're not uh, ascertainments, ascertainments of the importance of things in an objective eternal world. They are um, uh, acts of will. Um, so anyway, we'll, 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 we'll get to that. But I mean, uh, part, of, part of this is... Uh, it's whether or not uh, the things yeah. which are supposedly objective standards are viewed by Nietzsche himself as being human creations, which they are. Um, 
Yeah, I was not thinking about the question of objective or not standards, but just from the standpoint of how you can have like just sort of like a pure actor or, or, or something that tries that uh, overlooks right, right. or ignores you're, you're, or subjugates. You're missing, the, you're, miss, you're, missing, you're missing the point because one, he's not okay. focused on the purity of it. And two, he is exactly taking a previous paradigm in which everything can be uh, judged finally as being a claim of truth and stands or falls by the truth of the claim. And he is deliberately subverting and reversing that hierarchy, right? And, in, and is, that, is that based upon our just basically epistemic limitations so that that's no. a reasonable thing to do? No, it's not an epistemic thing at all. Um, oh. It's a value. It's okay, a value. well, I'll drop, I'll drop my question. So I, I guess I'm so out of the in, flow here. So sorry at, about at, that. At the very beginning of, uh, at the very beginning of um, uh, Beyond Good and Evil, right? Um, one of the things you find is the falseness of a judgment is not for us necessarily an objection to the judgment. In this respect, our new language may sound strangest. The question is to what extent it is life promoting, life preserving, species preserving, perhaps even species cultivating. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with, but I can see that. What, sure. I'm, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to point out there is that, is that uh, for Nietzsche, he doesn't care if it's true. Okay. So that, that seems like a different kind of statement then. Okay, I get, I can understand someone saying I don't care if it's true. That, that makes sense. But, okay, that clarifies it's things. Not, it's, kind not of an a, epistemic, it's not an epistemic. It's not an epistemic claim, right? Uh, if you're if you're about to if you're about to it's a, it's uh, a values claim. If you're about to build a house, right? Someone telling you that the house is not currently there doesn't move you, right? Someone says, "Look, right now there is no house sitting on this lot, right? In this." planned foundation area. There's no house there at all. There aren't even any bricks there. And he's like, yeah, so what? I'm still going to build the house I was planning to build. And as long as the house that you build in your head, the projected house, is more important to you than the current state of the world, right? your aims and your intentions and the future house you're building are vastly more important to you than any ascertainment of any state of the world, epistemic or otherwise. right? Your, 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 your action and your intended action and uh, what you will to exist afterwards, your acts of production are determining for you, right. not your perception yep. or ascertainments of truth. So that, that subordination of the theoretical uh, uh, ascertainment of truth to the, to the practical acting uh, legislative uh, will is precisely the reversal that Nietzsche is all about. Yes, I, I, that, I, that's fine. It, it, still, it still seems like a bit, little bit of wordplay because it, that which somebody sets as a goal to bring about, um, if they succeed in bringing that about, then they have changed the state of reality, which is to say they've made something that wasn't true now true. So I, I don't see how that, you know, so it seems a bit of semantics to me, but again, I'm no doubt missing. <laughs> can, I, can I make one comment? Sure, go ahead, James. Yeah, um, for Brent, like one of the things that's uh, helped me studying um, Heidegger's take on Nietzsche and just in general understanding Nietzsche and Heidegger together is uh, to sort of suspend my normal way of thinking, which is to compare what I already know about logic and uh, everything else I understand about philosophy and suspend that so that I can think the thoughts of the writer and think the thoughts of Nietzsche and Heidegger as they intended them. And then after I do that and allow myself to do that for a while, which is often like counterintuitive to things I'm used to thinking, I allow myself to have that. And then later on, once I get a really good understanding or think I have a be much better understanding of the whole scope of this work in particular, then I'll step back and say, okay, now let me jump back into my normal I guess, metaphysical way of thinking or my m normal modes of logic and see if any of that, uh, how I could understand it that way. Because otherwise, like, uh, you'll torture yourself like I did, like about every term and everything happening. I'm Not that that's the end all, but I did, that helped me a lot to be able to get through the work and to yeah, not it's not It's not bad stop. advice, but I'll, 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 I'll summarize even more shortly, right? You cannot understand the thought of a thinker by thinking your thoughts instead of his, right? You have to be willing yeah, obviously. to think his thoughts, and that means you have to be willing to uh, uh, structure the concepts, et cetera, in the way that the person is laying them out, right? And if he tells you that what I mean by truth is X, 
then you can't substitute your own word meaning for it and think that he must mean the same thing and then find a contradiction in it. Because the only thing you're gonna find is a contradiction between the way he thinks and the way you think, right? You're not gonna find a, a contradiction the way he thinks. Right, yeah, I'm perfectly fine with understanding how people want to define a word and use it, and I can be flexible with that. I'm just, uh, that was not really my problem or point. It was, it was, uh, well, it was partly the point because to give up completely a notion of truth as correspondence um, is counterintuitive for me. And he's not, the, the, I, I imagine what, what he's, what he's doing with the notion of truth as correspondence is he's claiming that it, it is always a, um, a deliberate falsification of reality for um, limited posited uh, uh, conditional purposes. Right. Well, I wonder though, but you're saying that's not an epistemic statement that just acknowledges our implicit epistemic limitations. So we don't have epistemic because it's not fundamentally anything. it's not epistemic because it's not fundamentally about the ascertainment of truth. It's fundamentally about uh, possibilities of action. It's fundamentally a practical, not well, an epistemic. Well, is it? Well, there are tr there are truths about what are possibilities of action. Yes, but there's also possibilities of acting. <laughs> Right, right. And so when we, when we think about, he, a, well, when we he, think about a possibility of acting, we're necessarily thinking about the concepts or the ideas, which could be no. about about what we can do we're, and we're, bring about also, in reality. We're also acting. Sure, of course. Right. So uh, whether or not the fact that something is happening on the plane of intellect or concept, uh, and whether or not you you outside are having judgments of uh, truth have been epistemic claims about it, right? is not controlling for someone who is acting. What is controlling for someone who is acting, what are, their, what are their possibilities of action? Sure, I totally agree with that. That's right, possibilities are possibilities, but our knowledge of possibilities or our beliefs about, about what are, is possible and not, that's in the realm of the epistemic then. Not simply. Not no, simply. not simply, sure. Not, not simplicit or there's other things involved, like, you, like you're saying, of course. Even just being epistemic for a section, a second, uh, I don't think you can get a uh, a notion of possibility distinct from the notion of action. You need an entire doctrine of action to even formulate the concept of possibility. Well, you can, for example, think it's possible that some undecided decided conjecture in mathematics is provable or not. You you can no possibilities there, even though uh, that's about all you can do at this point. Yes, but the question is, what sense does it have that they are possible? There's multiple senses of possible, of course. So it depends on what the context we're talking about is. What I'm saying is that the no if you're talking about possibilities of action, you need an entire doc doctrine of what action is to understand the concept possible, which is not an epistemic concept. Right. It's an actual. But it's more concept. than just what the concept of action is. It would be what the concept of action is exactly for creatures like us, right? Uh, not necessarily, <laughs> but again, I think you're, you think you're getting very far afield and you're just, you're just, all you're going to do is, is, is miss the possibility uh, okay. of, a, of a philosophy other than the fair one enough. you came to it with, right? Okay. You're just, you're that's just going to, all, it's enough. just a complicated way of sticking fingers in your ears. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so, uh, I want to get back to, I usually go through first impressions of the, of the, of the three, uh, that is the whole thing. And then, then we can get to um, uh, the first part, that is, in this case, the fourth part. Um, I'm sure the same. But first, I want to get a set of uh, initial reactions. Uh, we can start with Joe. And this could include questions of what was, sorry, you're still on mute, Joe. This could include uh, questions or things that uh, you uh, want us to make sure we cover in the discussion, uh, as well as your reactions to it. Um, that's a that's a difficult one. Just to jump in on top, I didn't, uh, given my rather sloppy way of uh, attacking this this reading this session, and uh, well, there are that you want to have was, explain justice. So we'll get, we'll definitely get to that one. But yeah, you know, justice was one. Of course, I did this morning. Yep. Now, uh, where I sort of came to a grinding halt was in the chapter on the Overman. Yes, I began to wonder what. <laughs> And, and so, you know, I didn't finish that chapter. That's when I decided okay. to skip on ahead and do whatever else. No now, question, it's the weightiest chapter here. 
Yeah, the eternal return of the same uh, seems to be familiar. I, it's almost as yes. if we'd covered this, covered this earlier. Yes. Uh, and I like the idea the way it solves the Parmenides, Parmenides problem, more or less, you know. Uh, everything's renewing all the time and changing all the time, but it keeps, keeps there's a sameness of certain, well, the same does recur for, I guess, what we want to call things. Well, we'll, so, we'll, we'll get to the logical um, issues uh, with the idea of the return, eternal return uh, um, when we get to it in more detail. But it, there's no question that it's a, uh, it's a slippery concept, and especially uh, the question of how um, uh, uh, logically establishable it is. But the, the, the fundamental thing going on there is that it is not uh, primarily something, yeah. it is not primarily something arrived at by a process of deductive reasoning as something which must be the case, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, related to this conversation we've just been having. Um, there, there is a, uh, um, uh, this is what, what the, is going on on page 213 where he calls it a twofold false, falsification. But uh, the, uh, it's the role that it plays in Nietzsche's philosophy as a whole. Um, but we can definitely also talk about the, the problems with it. Um, uh, but yes, the eternal return of the same chapter has the most um, uh, just going over ground we've already seen before and earlier in, 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 in volume three. I want to just mention a little bit of the structure of the Overman chapter because it can definitely help um, to understand how all, all that's going on there. The, the, the first part of it is sort of a why this is important or why um, uh, human being and a certain kind of human being moves to the center of philosophical concern. Um, but then he uh, gets into this capsule history of, of modern philosophy, right? Um, and that's uh, the, in some ways, the meatiest section. Uh, well, at least it's got a rival, <laughs> one rival for the meatiest part of the section. But it, it, uh, uh, there is a, a depth of assumption about how much the reader will already know about the history of uh, modern philosophy there that can be very challenging, right? Um, but starting with a representation in Descartes and going through uh, appetite and will and then uh, absolute spirit and so forth, he, he has this whole um, run through of the um, history of philosophy before Nietzsche that's culminating in Hegel. Um, and, and all of that um, is culminating, not culminating with the final science, but um, uh, arise at Hegel at the idea of absolute subjectivity. Um, and you have to sort of know um, that he's treating that as a as Nietzsche's starting point, as a reaction to the idea of absolute subjectivity, um, so that what Nietzsche himself is doing is seen against that background and and within that uh, within that history. Um, and so the, the next section is uh, how Nietzsche has uh, reacted to or inverted Hegel, uh, what he's done to Hegel, um, and uh, Heidegger himself calls this. Uh, a, a toppling of the previous uh, position of human reason. Um, and he calls it an inversion. Um, so that's, uh, and, and that's the, the, the necessary background, according to Heidegger, for understanding what, the, what makes the Overman doctrine necessary in Nietzsche, right? Um, and this is where he calls Nietzsche's version, not only absolute subjectivity, but consummate subjectivity. Um, consummate meaning final or perfected uh, subjectivity. Um, there's a sense in which Hegel was still too objective. He wasn't subjective enough. Um, or he hadn't made man the subject uh, enough. Um, and that Nietzsche is trying to consummate the history of modern subjectivity uh, that way. Um, so all, all of that is uh, quite challenging because it, it's situating Nietzsche in a much bigger philosophical um, formation, so to speak, that runs from Descartes to Hegel. So we'll have to go through that. Um, and then after he's done all that, then he says, so then what do you get in this doctrine of, of Nietzsche's, you know, what, why, uh, what comes out of that kind of inversion of Hegel, right? And that's the uh, most of the remainder of the chapter um, of the, of um, uh, what Overman doctrine is like, or something like that. And that's also the place where you can hear the most notes of uh, the, the the scary bits, if I can put it that way, the ways in which uh, Nietzsche is foreshadowing uh, some awful things in the 20th century. Um, uh, so 
all of that is in the Overman chapter. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's kind of uh, striking and in some ways shocking that that, that that immediately goes to the justice chapter right afterwards. But um, the 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 point is to think of the Overman chapter as it, it easily could have been you know three or four chapters, right? It could be one. Why do we? Care, why is the doctrine of Overman um, central to Nietzsche's uh, philosophy? The second is what's the history of modern philosophy as the history of modern subjectivity or something before him? What does he do specifically to Hegel to modify that tradition? Um, all of those could have been in three different chapters. And then only the fourth one is, you know, what results in terms of content. And because he's not jumping to the last of those, he, he's going to find the things in the content um, out of the things that it is um, inverted, especially out of the inversion of, uh, of, uh, of Hegel. But there's also elements of it which are um, still very much in the same vein, right? It's, it's, it's still recognizably a modern slash Cartesian project. Um, uh, he's fulfilling elements of things which were already there in Descartes uh, rather than just uh, objecting to them, uh, according to Heidegger. Um, I, smelled, I smelled that. I couldn't deduce it, but I, I certainly yes. said, you know, how is this sort of internal thinking stuff? Uh, all that? Why, is, why is this different from Descartes? Right. So in, 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 in our, in our, in part four, um, there's a whole section, um, a whole, a whole third, third session will take us from, uh, well, the interconnection between the fundamental positions of Descartes and Nietzsche is chapter 20, right? So, um, this will, this will come back. You know, you know, to, it, that's the new table of contents, right? Yes. The new table of contents, <laughs> part one, chapter 20. So you have to go to page 289 to find it. Yeah, um, in the back of the book. Middle Interconnection yeah. between the fundamental positions of Descartes and Nietzsche. Yum, yum. I should read that first. Right. So, <laughs> so, so the, the, the point is that um, the, Overman, the Overman chapter, that I want to just, that's tying it forward. Uh, it's going to tie it into modern philosophy. I want to also tie it back. When we would finish part one, sorry, volume three, part one, um, uh, remember that he called, um, uh, he talked about the, um, the anthropomorphism of Nietzsche's philosophy as a whole. Yes. Right at, at the end yes. of that, and that was sort of yes. a saving a creek in there. Right. That's very much going on here too. I mean, the it, clearly an, an, anthropomorphism is what's giving rise to the need for something like a doctrine like Overman. Right. Um, I'm trying to wonder how is this how is this substantively different from uh, you know the, the uh, what do you call it, phenomenology and would you just imagine your or solipsism? Uh, so it's quite certainly different from solipsism uh, in terms of uh, its relation to phenomenology. Phenomenology comes up twice here, uh, once as the method of Hegel, which has a very different meaning than it is for uh, uh, anything like Nietzsche, and second as the method of uh, Husserl Heidegger himself. Um, you don't get phenomenology in Nietzsche. What you get instead is something which is a little bit of a move in that direction, which is something like the, uh, the focus on the body, um, which is a term of art for, uh, uh, for Nietzsche. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, um, yeah, beginning of the Overman section, um, not quite the beginning. Uh, right, 218, uh, the quote from Nietzsche from Zussberg Zarathustra on the despisers of the body, part one. Be awakened in knowing, say, I am body, body entirely and nothing else. Soul is merely a word for something about the body. The body is a great reason, a plurality with one meaning, a war and a peace, a herd and a shepherd. An instrument of your body is also your little reason, my brother, which you call spirit, a little instrument and toy of your great reason. So th th this is the inversion of Hegel that, he's, that, that Heidegger is, is pointing out and stressing, right? Uh, in Hegel, you have a, uh, a notion of the... Um, uh, Reason is what is um, uh, uh, universal and rational in man and lets him uh, understand the whole and the real as the rational, right? So that the real and the rational coincide in, the, in a completely understood uh, whole. Um, and uh, it, is, it, it is that which is sort of man's contact with the absolute or the truth, right? Um, uh, the, the rational is the highest in man. It's the way in which he contacts truth. It's the way in which he uh, uh, is in touch with absolute spirit or is an instance of absolute spirit. Um, and uh, all of that is this, you know, hypervaluation of the rational. 
end of end of the theoretical, if I can put it that way, or the concern with the true. That's right? Nietzsche. That's Nietzsche. No, that's provided. Hegel. That's all Hegel. That's all Hegel. Okay, that's all Hegel. That clear. Okay. Right. And 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 what Nietzsche is doing is he's saying that reason that you praise so much is a embodied function of an organism. <laughs> You went to the bathroom. Um, that came out with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is. It is a. Uh, uh, it is a. It is a tool and instrument of the uh, of the life drives in this little evolved thing, right? Um, and as such, it is um, uh, not the. Uh, not not a. Uh, it's not even that it's not a source of uh, uh, of eternal truth. It's that what truth there is in it came to it from what was programmed in, into it from below, so to speak not received from what it encountered on high, right? Um, it is, uh, it is um, underneath drive, goals, purpose, will, uh, and a thin veneer of conceptual thinking on top of that as a tool. Um, that's what reason is. That's what he means when he says that um, uh, an instrument of your body is also your little re reason, which you call spirit, a little instrument toy of your great reason. His point is that he calls the body the great reason. He means that there's something like the uh, involved or embodied truth in the instincts or, the, uh, or something like that is more in contact with the uh, truth of what is than conceptual thinking is. This sounds um, more like rationalization. A reason, it's not reason he's, he's describing, he's talking about rationalization. When he's you not talking about rationalization. Activity. He's not talking about rationalization. He's saying, he's saying that uh, um, uh, the reason that you perceive external reality and regard it as uh, not subject to your will is because it is useful for the purposes of your will to do so. Why? Because your, uh, your, your, your will and those faculties both co-evolved to secure the aims of your organism, right? And uh, the, the success of that adaptation is the actual reason in them. This sounds like yeah. Richard Dawkins. Absolutely. Um, uh, but but the, it, it's, uh, yes, it, it, is, it, is, it is all that, right? But the, the point is to see, um, uh, there's a tendency to see, when it, to, to think that if something is subjective, perspectival, uh, founded on drives, founded on instincts, this, this means that it is a subjective opinion and a mere opinion and ephemeral and not in contact with the truth. And Nietzsche is, complete, is completely blowing away that, that prejudice. Mm -hmm. He's saying uh, uh, your, your instinctual capacities uh, are the things which have been, uh, been in touch with reality for hundreds of millions of years. They're the real thing. And your, uh, your, your methodological conceits that are 400 years old are uh, a little toy that you're playing with right now, uh, which might prove useful or might not to your organism. But the organism is going to be the determining thing and your drives are the real thing. And that's the actual place that you're, uh, the great reason it is your evolved body has contact with reality. So you don't look for contact with reality in your uh, latest evolved method. You look in it uh, in the fact that you perceive an external world, orient on objects, uh, uh, think conceptually, all of those are proven methods for conquering the world, proven by hundreds of millions of years of evolution, right? Um, and that's what makes them a great reason and, and real. So um, he wants, he calls this bodying reason. Um, and he, and, and uh, that means that something like um, the drives or instincts or the life force or the will is uh, more in contact with reality than conceptual thinking alone is, right? So Sounds in a way, in, in a way, this is furthering uh, a, a criticism of Hegel that was already there in Schopenhauer, right? Uh, Schopenhauer, famously, the world's will and representation, right? Uh, contrasts um, uh, the uh, represent representation understanding world, uh, which is only uh, only mirroring the world, right? But underneath all of that, driving all of that, there is. Um, Instead, the drives of the will. Um, this is, it, to Schopenhauer, a furthering of the kind of Kantian Copernican revolution that sees um, our perceptions as being created by uh, structures of the understanding that are um, pre-conscious and uh, determined for us. Um, we have to think that way because this is the structure of our understanding. The later understanding would see those things as themselves evolved and useful. Um, but uh, that there's something like a uh, uh, structuring of the possible perceptibles that's coming from the structure of the mind itself. That's just Kant, right? And that that 
is uh, something where um, uh, the, the uh, the will is more basic in all of, or the practice is more basic in all that than the conceptual or the theoretical. Um, that's also in Kant. It's in Kant in the uh, second and third critiques and the subordination of uh, uh, the understanding to, uh, uh, to to the will in both morals and art and whatever else, right? And and that's something which um, Schopenhauer runs with even more fully, right? He even more stresses the fact that the um, uh, a will that is without the understanding and kind of blind um, is the seat of instinct or appetite um, and is completely in contrast to the uh, world of representation. The world is also as will. So that's all stuff you've already find in, in Schopenhauer's critique of mm -hmm. Hegel. And from Schopenhauer's point of view, Hegel has um, made the world look too uh, dissectedly rational and has left appetite and the unreasonable out of it. Um, we would say he's left the unconscious out of it. Um, Nietzsche is one of these, uh, it, one, a person in this tradition of 19th century criti uh, critics of Hegel who was emphasizing all the stuff that was left out of Hegelian rationalism and optimism as um, uh, insufficiently pessimistic, insufficiently focused on the non-rational, insufficiently noticed on the ways in which uh, uh, what is prior to uh, uh, reason is motivating reason. You find that in 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 Marx and in uh, Nietzsche and in uh, 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 Kierkegaard in his own way and in um, um, Schopenhauer, right? It's a it's, it's like a 19th century uh, cottage industry to come up with ways in which uh, uh, Hegel was too uh, flip with how rational the world is. Um, so Nietzsche's particular take on that is to um, uh, start from man as the rational animal and say the animal part is the controlling part and the rational part is the, you know, the, the latest little Philip on top. But, um, okay, so uh, all, all of that is the, uh, the body reversal on Hegel, if I can put it that way. Um, but the, the point of the next section for Heidegger is to show how in modern subjective philosophy from Descartes to Hegel, um, the the human understanding already took over the world, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, Descartes defined the, uh, the the real as the thinkable, and what is not uh, rationally thinkable does not exist. Um, and Leibniz said that uh, representation and appetite are everything. Uh, representation um, is. Uh, uh, the, the court that decides whether or not something counts as real. Um, where by representation, we mean the, uh, the conceptual machinery or structure that we consciously make ourselves, that is our own creation, our own fiat, so to speak, that we try to get to correspond to reality. And then we take reality and we torture it to get it to answer uh, you know, uh, uh, whether or not it fits into our conceptual machinery, right? That's the language of, of Bacon, right? Um, so th there's a, uh, a notion that we're putting the question to nature to get it to fit into our concepts. Um, but the conceptual stuff that we consciously create is, uh, when it, where it passes that, of course, is going to be uh, the understandable rational reality. And outside that, there is only the unreal, right? So there's a sense in which um, uh, there's already a projection that uh, everything that is is understandable in principle, right? And that's there in Descartes because if it's not understandable in principle, it isn't real, right? To be to be un to be real is the same as to, is same as to have thinkable attributes. Um, so that uh, uh, so that the 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 next part of the discussion it, there is to is to point out the way in which subjectivity and uh, objectivity are related as the same thing. Uh, and this is something which is a little bit hard for later philosophers to see, if I can put it this way. Um, but subject originally just means uh, that of which predication is predicated, right? If you're doing biology, life is the subject that is being uh, discussed, right? Um, but uh, in subjectivism, in the modern philosophical sense, uh, subject has come to take on a different meaning. It means something like the pole of consciousness or, or, or uh, or thought or understanding. Why does that happen? The answer is because once you have the Cartesian move to representation and you're ever understanding everything in terms of your concepts of it, your clear and distinct concepts of it, um, the subject of all the predication is your thoughts about things, not the things. Um, so 
man is becoming the subject because what you think about things is the thing that you are deciding one way or the other as you make judgments. You're not deciding, you know, the car is moving 55 miles an hour. You're deciding my thought that the car is moving at between 56 and uh, 54 miles per hour is uh, I, I judge to be true within theoretical, within experimental error or something, right? You, because you're judging uh, a set of concepts that you've consciously created and thrown over the world as to their the adequacy of the representation, right? The subject of all your predica predications is actually you, right? It's, it's how you think. That's what Descartes is always judging. Um, and it's secondary that that reaches to the car. The car is the object about which things are being asserted, right? But the subject of the discussion is Descartes' thoughts, right? So that, that is the sense in which modern thought is a uh, subjectivist thought. Right? It's already made the move to only asking itself about the things which it knows that it can know about, which are the thoughts that it chooses to think. Mm -hmm. And this is how it hopes to achieve certainty about those things. It will, it will, uh, where it cannot achieve certainty, uh, certainty it will uh, suspend judgment until it can, but it is projected of everything that it can achieve certainty about it with the appropriate number of experiments and the appropriate conceptual nets thrown over things. And if it can't, those things don't exist because they don't get to count as existing if they're not catchable by reason. So that that's kind of the the the, the view of modern philosophy, Descartes onward, that uh, uh, Heidegger is here calling modern subjectivism, and he's calling it modern subjectivism because it has made man's thoughts, man's consciousness, reason, the subject matter of all predication. Right? What does reason think about X? What does science say about X? Right? What does the scientific method determine should be said about X? Uh, what should be positive about X and can it be refuted once posited? All of those things being seen as equivalent is the same as making something like an abstract reason the subject matter of which all philosophical predication predicates. Right? Reason becomes the subject of history um, and of thought. So in that sense, you've got something like a universal subject or a transcendental ego in Kant that is the actual subject matter of history, right? Hegel turns that into absolute spirit. He thinks that uh, 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 human history is the history of thought waking up, is the history of some piece of, re of reality becoming conscious of the nature of reality and its place within it, right? Um, so human reason is instantiated in, you know, uh, various, uh, half-assed ways uh, down to, uh, uh, you know, D Descartes and, and, and uh, uh, Kant, uh, and eventually arrives at the perfection of under understanding in, uh, culminates in his existence in Berlin, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so, but the point is, that is, that is meant to be the um, uh, uh, self-appearing of consciousness to itself, right? The history of reason and the history of consciousness and the history of philosophy are the same thing. They are the universal subject, reason, waking up or becoming aware of itself, right? So self-consciousness out of consciousness is the, uh, is the uh, goal of the world process to Hegel, right? And what this means is something like arriving at the truth, knowing the truth, uh, the truth being reason as such and the true as such, um, all those things are equivalent and there's something like the same thing as, the, as a, uh, uh, it's not quite that it's a purely theoretical attitude. It's a representational attitude towards the world that, re that regards the world as a human creation made from a uh, web of human concepts, right? So there's an element in which it is a creation, uh, a creation of reason. Um, so that is what Hegel means by absolute spirit. Um, so all of that is the background of the subject that then Nietzsche is going to invert by saying, yeah, all of that is just a function of an embodied reason of a body, right? Um, meaning that the, uh, the, 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 the reason involved has already conquered what is. It's already you know, become absolute spirit. It's, always, it's already digested uh, everything that can exist. Uh, and when I say has digested, I don't mean that it has actually done so. I mean that it has, uh, theoretically projected that that which it can digest and understand is real and that which it cannot digest and understand is not. Uh, not is not real, just is not. Um, so so uh, 
the point is that the, the, the subject that is being inverted is already an absolute subject. Okay, uh, it's not the individual subject. It's not you know me solipsistically having these thoughts in my head, right? It's the it's the the uh, universal subject of all history, right? Um, and that universal subject of all history, Nietzsche is saying, no, well, actually, it's always an embodied perspectival uh, uh, fooling itself thing, uh, whose truths are always error, uh, and that are always separated, isolated perspectives. Um, from the standpoint of the positings of the needs of that organism for this little tiny window of time, right? So that that's the move that he's making on Hegel. It's a it's a uh, a um, somewhat skeptical move in some ways, but fundamentally it's a, a, a somewhat positive move in other ways. But it's also just this evolutionary thinking move, right? That the the this this uh, this consciousness uh, that is supposedly the uh, uh, Hegelian absolute um, is. Uh, actually just, you know, uh, an evolved embodied thing, right? So this is part and parcel of Nietzsche's atheism as well, that, 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 uh, that uh, uh, Hegelian absolute spirit was too godlike, and he's going to uh, debunk it, right? The, the, the actual perspectives that occur are the human perspectives of particular cultures and particular thinkers, not a universal human reason. Right, that's what that's where there's a cultural relativist aspect of Nietzsche as well, right? Coming in the same way, and that goes along with all all of these truths being posited, right? Meaning created uh, by particular creators at particular times for particular purposes, right? So, okay, all all of that is just how he's not being Hegel, right? Um, and the question is, what is what what does he uh, what does he put in its place? So there is a, a new subject of history, right? In in in, uh, in Nietzsche, and this is what Heidegger is saying: the Overman the role the, the Overman concept fulfills, right? It's the replacement for Hegelian absolute spirit, right? So there's a kind of projected future possible man uh, or uh, possible philosopher that is the uh, uh, replacement for the fully awake uh, uh, Hegelian philosopher who has understood everything, right? And the new, uh, th this replacement is not gonna understand everything. He's gonna legislate everything. He's not going to know everything. He's gonna say, this is what should be, right? He's, no, he's now an acting man, not just a thinking man. He is not trying to understand everything. He is uh, defining horizons within which he legislates that this should be this way and not that way, right? Uh, with the stack being true understanding of what's already within the horizon he tries to understand is one value, but above that comes the art which wants to transform it in directions which improve uh, uh, that, and above all, that still stands whatever empowers this uh, uh, soul to do all that, right? So that there is a there is simply a drive to uh, digest, understand, legislate, change, command what is at the root of it. And that's what uh, Heidegger looks at this and says, well, that was actually already there in Descartes. Descartes had that same ambition to legislate what shall be. He just called it, um, you know, if I don't have a clear and distinct idea about it, it it's not real. He was still projecting the human reason as the tribunal before which things had to appear to decide whether they were real or not. And in that sense, he already had this ambition to uh, control everything, or at least to understand everything. Um, the shift from understand to control has uh, is part and parcel of this reversal. So N Nietzsche calls this consummate subjectivity because it's way more subjective than Hegel's, which still had this connection to an absolute truth. Um, and uh, he also calls it an inverted subjectivity. It's inverted because the previous standard was that reason was the highest thing in man, and now reason is just a tool of the drives. So there's a revaluation of the uh, what previously would have just been seen as a, a source of distortion or prejudice and is now seen as the, uh, the source of uh, principle of life or of will or of command. So all, all of that is, you know, where, where's, where does this overman thing come in? Why does Nietzsche need an overman concept? And the answer is, the overman is the replacement subject of history. It is the 
uh, it has the place of Hegelian absolute spirit or Kantian transcendental ego or uh, uh, Cartesian consciousness, right? All of those things have become instead overman. And overman is a, is a formal concept. It's just uh, in the sense that its content is empty, only its form is given. Um, uh, content is empty because uh, the future man will decide what that content is because the essence of the formal concept is that it is self-command, right? So you can't constrain what a self-command, what a free self-commanding thing will be because the free self-commanding thing decides that. Um, all you can say is that it will supersede all the previous uh, 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 valuations or all the previous uh, um, uh, orientations of these things. All the previous orientations has some way in which the truth was put above, outside of, beyond uh, the, 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 the commanding will as something which would determine whether or not the commanding will should do this or not, right? Into which, which, with which the, the, the will had to be in conformity or be bad, right? Um, that's gone and it's replaced by the uh, commanding will command what it commands and it's gonna command from the standpoint of what furthers its commanding. This is what he, uh, Heidegger, calls the uh, empowering of overpowering, right? This is the idea that uh, um, the, the, the ambitious, this ambitious subject wants most of all uh, uh, to rule, right? To command what shall be. Um, that, by the way, is something you find back in Fichte um, a little bit, where the, uh, uh, the, the outside the will was whatever resisted the will. Um, so the, the attempt is to transform whatever resists the will into something which the will can control or assimilate. Anyway, so that's, that's where, what this overman idea is. And then after that, he gives some things about content, despite it being a, a formal concept. You could tell them things about it because it's, uh, by the fact that it's inverted, it's not gonna put reason highest. By the fact that it's an overturning of all the past perspectives, it's gonna be revolutionary. It's not gonna accept past perspectives of good and evil and so on. Um, and those are a lot of the things which wind up being destructive in the overman idea. If, if, uh, later historical point of view. All right, I, I've, I've been babbling on about, uh, uh, oh man, I should give you guys a chance to ask questions because some of that was probably incomprehensible. Pete, I feel like Pete wants to say something. No, I, I actually know, so, so that, 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 that was, I thought, um, very good in uh, clarifying uh, what Nietzsche was saying. Uh, that setting the context, uh, the you know Heidegger is following along in this Overman chapter, so I, I thought it was a really good summary and helped me, uh, but no, you know, pushback or anything. Like that. Sure, Steve, questions? Yeah. So does this tie back to the concept of beyond good and evil? Now yes. that you have the Overman that commands, you don't need good yes. and evil anymore. Uh, yes, because the, the, uh, uh, from Nietzsche's point of view, uh, good and evil and as previously understood, where morality as previously understood, were the idea that um, the will was only good if it was in conformity with an objective standard or, uh, or, or truth that existed metaphysically in the heavens that was not commanded by, for human, by human beings for human purposes, but just was. So the idea of an objective overarching truth uh, of, or, or aim or morals um, is, uh, uh, from Nietzsche's point of view, the moral worldview. It's the platonic worldview. And it's the idea that there is a objective standard of right to which the will either conforms and is good or fails to conform and is evil, right? And what is beyond good and evil and what Nietzsche is aiming at is that, uh, uh, the claim is that all such perspectives are things which have been legislated by human wills, right? Mm -hmm. All hitherto existing moralities um, were posited and created by some human beings for some human purposes. And uh, as such, they are, uh, they are, they are human creations and uh, the, the ruling function in human life is precisely the creation of such schemes, right? Um, in that sense, man is free in the sense of autonomous, in the sense that he only obeys the laws that he gives to himself. Um, but that's a collective we. The actual giving of the laws and the following of the laws are two different sets of people in reality. Um, 
so in that sense, uh, it's it's going to be revolutionary because it's positing something like uh, uh, a legislative power to create new standards of morality that is necessarily going to overturn all the previous ones because all the previous ones viewed man as not having that legislative power. You know, that that, that power was, re was, was reserved to the nature of reality or uh, what is objectively true and good or, you know, the truth of morals or something like that. Um, to Nietzsche, all of that is Platonism. All of that is a particular past doctrine that uh, he sees himself as wanting to overcome. Um, the um, There's a, a very good... Uh, Thing. I think it's in the justice chapter where Nietzsche explains why he thinks that way. Uh, is it in the justice chapter? No, it's earlier. Um, I'm thinking of the quote where he talks about, uh, um, uh, yes, okay, page, it's in the Overman chapter, page 228. All the beauty and sublimity we have bestowed on real and imaginary things, I wish to reclaim as the property and product of man as his fairest apology. Man as poet, as thinker, as God, uh, as love, as power. Oh, with what regal liberality he has lavished gifts upon things so as to impoverish himself and make himself feel wretched. His most selfish act hitherto has been to admire and worship and know how to conceal from himself that it was he who created what he admired. His point being that from his point of view, all the moralities that men have obeyed for, you know, uh, throughout their history were human creations and they're not taking credit for having created them, right? They're, they're pretending that they're objective facts about the world that they just came to understand, you know, last week or, you know, 2000 years ago. Um, but at any rate, that they're just, uh, that are only discovered, not invented, and that they are just obeying. And Nietzsche is saying, no, actually, that's your work of art. You should be proud of it, right? Uh, you should recognize it as something which uh, you made. Now, there's a, there's a shift in perspective in that that's hard for people in the old uh, understanding to take in the sense that, um, if you say that something is a willful creation of human beings to someone who thinks that only objective morality deserves to be followed, you're saying that there's no reason to follow that thing, right? It was just a human whim, so why should I follow it? Yeah. Uh, Nietzsche, is, Nietzsche is saying everything you've ever followed was a human whim, right? It, uh, it's just some of them worth, worth more than others. So um, uh, in that sense, he's not trying to uh, completely overthrow all of the content of past morality. He is trying to under... Uh, overthrow how it is understood and especially um, how free mankind regards himself with respect to it. Um, he wants mankind to be free with respect to the moralities that it legislates for itself. Um, does that make sense? Yes, yeah. very much so. I also have a question all the way back on, um, it's in the first section on 212. Yes. The it's the second paragraph down, begins with will to power, says what a being as such is. Yes. Namely, what it is in its constitution, eternal return of the same, says how being is as a whole when it is constituted. When it is so constituted, yes. So constituted. I don't really understand what's that, what that says. Sure, sure. So the first part of it is the difficult idea that will to power is what a being is as such, right? What it is in its constitution. So, um, that's a that's the end of a very long chain of reasoning, right? Um, but the 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 idea is that when you're saying that something is a being, uh, you're saying that it's a a stable enough concept to be reckoned on as real, and relied on for uh, regulating uh, judgments of the intellect or uh, or uh, human actions. That's what you mean by it being uh, a being. It's a it's a reality that that. Uh, 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 has to be reckoned with, so to speak. Um, uh, from Nietzsche's point of view, that's the same as saying that there is some nexus of human purposes in which it appears significantly enough that it that it uh, it is a it is a value to recognize and uh, conform to something like that. Um, and that means that uh, it was cr it's what you have as its definition was um, projected there by some mind for some set of purposes. The being itself is externalized will to power. It is, it is, uh, from, let's think about this in some of the terms of previous philosophies, right? Kant will tell you that the, uh, the object is something synthetically unified by your mind, right? Uh, 
uh, Hegel will say that you're, you, you, uh, you live in a set of um, mental constructions uh, of your, your map of reality, right? And your, your, your mental map of reality are the things you're actually reacting to. Hegel and Hegel, Nietzsche is saying the same thing, that you are, you are reacting to the mental constructs you have projected and thrown upon the external world, on the chaos. And those things are their importance and value uh, to you and for you, for your purposes, which is the same as saying they are uh, values your will to power reckons with. That's what beings are to you, is the claim. Okay. So okay. the sense in which beings are as will to power is that they are, they are these projected, made, uh, psychological, uh, uh, functional things, right? Defined in terms of their uh, use values and their uh, uh, conceptual formulation in whatever, you know, uh, whatever subjective constructs you use for them, whatever structure you use for them. That's what beings are, right? Okay. And that's then the what? That's the what. Then eternal return of the same says how being is as a whole and so constituted. The claim is that if everything that is, is uh, uh, a, a will to power in that sense, then what actually happens in, in uh, what actually is actualized in the course of history or time or becoming? The answer is, it is never the case that anything is anything other than will to power. Every particular thing you could uh, 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 examine uh, or look at is will to power. So will to power is the uniform pattern that is thrown onto all things. So everything that happens is just a different configuration of will to power, right? That is- All things, all things or all beings? Uh, all things, um, but beings, um, uh, how being is as a whole and constituted. The, 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 the claim is that um, uh, there, is a, there is a sameness of structure coming from the universality of the of the concept that be, that things which exist conform to right um, it will never be the case that you know in one instance there was a world that consisted of uh, little scraps of will to power and a certain power configuration and five minutes later there was a different cartesian world where everything was representation that doesn't happen right uh, his, history is only the unfolding of uh, Will to power, 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 right? Um, yeah. In each case, the only thing that is changing is the specific configuration that those uh, will to power forces or values or understand, understood things are in, right? All of those have an essential sameness to them. All of them ha meet the pattern of will to power and all of them have a direction of their transformation which is contained within themselves. The direction of their transformation is what furthers the will to power of, the, of each force being, you know, uh, desired, pressed for by that force, right? So the 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 activity of the of the of the world consists in the vital forces of all the little separated wills, uh, separated and divided wills to power, each striving for whatever it is that they want, right? That is all that ever happens. So the the, the eternal return of the same is a formula for that is saying that. Uh, there, there is, there is one standing uh, 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 thing, thing that happens, which is just configurations of all the power. Now, there's an extra thought in, in, in the particular doctrine of eternal return of the same, which is a little bit beyond that, a little beyond that formal thing, um, which is the idea that the these configurations of will to power are finite and therefore recur. Um, so that it's not that one of these uh, power constellations happens only once at a dated instant. And at a later time, something else happens and there's never any uh, uh, similarity to continuity of them. Um, this is almost an extraneous addition, um, not to Nietzsche, but to Heidegger. Um, Heidegger sees the sameness of the eternal return of the same as coming from the unity of the concept of being that's being applied to things. Um, what, what, does, what, does the, uh, what does the Buddhist say will be in, it will be in the next, ent uh, next instant, om. Right, um, so alm has been replaced with will to power, but that's what you get—the same thing, right? That you you get alm after alm after alm, right, um, and nothing else. But the 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 will to power is also the notion of uh, this is the power animating the whole, or why the whole has a history. Um, so the last um, 
the last sec not the last section, the, the last explanation of what uh, Nietzsche means by will to power is when he says to stamp becoming with the character of being, that is the supreme will to power. And the point of that is that this is all meant to be a description of how becoming becomes. But if you record that uh, uh, becoming as uh, an eternally constant thing, then you're also saying that it is the eternally real thing. Uh, it is it is enduringly present and never changing, uh, which is the character of being rather than becoming. So uh, this is a little bit like the uh, famous lyric, you know, uh, change is not permanent, but uh, changes aren't permanent, but changes, right? The 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 will to power as the principle of change is the one thing that is eternally, right? Um, so the 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 projected eternal so being. Not, go ahead. Go so ahead. it's not a. a a part or an attribute of a being. It's separate from a being, will to power. Uh, will to power is the character of the being as a being. And it's also it's the, the, it's also the, the, uh, the, the driving force of the transformation of becoming in the sense that um, uh, one thing succeeds another as being more in the will to power direction of whatever is doing the succeeding. Um, but so it, uh, Will to power is meant to be something like the uh, the animating principle of the activity of the whole. Okay. If that makes sense, and 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 the the point uh, of this eternal transformation says, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> says how being is as a whole and so constituted is. There is a sense in which what this means is uh, that the world of will to power never changes. In that sense, um, the most basic character of beings never changes. Is eternal. Is being. Uh, rather than a becoming. Um, so uh, Heidegger sees uh, the fact that Nietzsche um, needs to explain how uh, the world appears as being, as being part of the structure of metaphysics. So he thinks that uh, anything which tries to tell you, <coughs> pardon me, um, uh, what, uh, what the being of beings is, will also wind up trying to tell you how beings as a whole are. And from Heidegger's point of view, that's happening because the concept of um, beings as such includes um, an all that's going to encompass all, all beings. So there's always gonna be an element of uh, how the whole is implied by, the con by, by any answer to the question, um, uh, what being means, right? Uh, and Heidegger's point in that is that uh, this is not specific to Nietzsche. Nietzsche didn't invent the fact that any notion of, of uh, a meaning of being winds up having something to say in addition about um, the, how the whole is. It has to do that because the generality of the concept being is going to imply some stable fact about beings as a whole, right? If you try to give someone a, a definition of all beings that applies to all beings, you're gonna wind up uh, pointing towards something which is an invariant of the whole. Right. Right? Then, yeah. Um, so that's just part of the, uh, from Heidegger's point of view, the logic of the structure of metaphysics, right? Uh, it's not something uh, that Nietzsche is putting there. The structure is forcing it, right? Um, where the structure means this articulated set of concepts of uh, metaphysics as um, a notion of being as a whole, a how beings as a whole are, a notion of truth or how that comes to be known, a notion of the mankind that comes to know that truth, uh, etc. cetera. Um, okay. Um, there are problems with this eternal return of the same notion in Nietzsche himself, because Nietzsche sometimes tries to give arguments in favor of it that are kind of slipshod arguments, right? From the standpoint of, you know, anyone being scientific about it. Um, and he kind of knows that. The proof that he kind of knows that is that he, uh, on page 213, uh, uh, he says, twofold falsification, one of the senses, the other of the mind, in order to preserve a world of being of perdurance of equivalence, that everything recurs as the closest approximation of a world of becoming to one of being, peak of the meditation. The point being that uh, 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 Nietzsche knows that there is an element of the eternal return of the same as a doctrine that is a myth. He knows that it is uh, a, uh, uh, a projection for human purposes, that it, that it has the character of an error, right? 
um, all the things which he has said about truth in the past, right? But there is a there is a motive driving him to posit it, and that motive is to uh, achieve the closest approximation of a world of becoming to one of being, right? He wants to find something uh, 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 stably true, and the stably true and the being and the eternal are connected. And so, uh, if the if the nature of the world is an all eternity, orderless chaos, the closest you can get to uh, uh, a, a world of a, a truth about being in that world is to uh, stamp the coming with the character of being, to find what is eternally unchanging in change. Right. So that's. The point is to, uh, that uh, uh, there are elements of the eternal turn of the same as in terms of the content of the doctrine, which are um, uh, slim, unmotivated, not proven, all the usual sort of you know, Scottish adjectives, right? Um, but this is not something of which Nietzsche is unaware. He's very much aware of it. And he's, he's positing this is a doctrine for its effects, right? Not for its truth. Um, and and that's you know the characteristic Nietzschean thing, right? Is that you 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 view all values and all uh, uh, doctrines from the standpoint of what they will tend to make people want or do, right? Not from the standpoint of you know are they are they eternally true and written in the heavens, right? He's not trying to find the eternally true written in the heavens. He's trying to uh, legislate what people should believe in order to govern men's conduct, right? Um, and the, what he sees in the notion of eternal return of the same is a way of giving weight to the temporal actions of man. There's a, a sense in which people think that, you know, the thing I'm doing now cannot possibly matter because it's a passing temporary thing. And he just says, no, uh, it, 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 uh, whatever you do echoes in eternity, right? To quote Russell Crowe, right? Um, the, 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 uh, there's an element of uh, giving eternal weight to the passing actions um, that's in the doctrine and meant to be in the doctrine. Um, there's another more, I can put this way, more nihilistic aspect of, of this chapter though, which is pointing out that um, all of this is also part of saying that the, um, uh, the universe or history has no goal or purpose and, or end, right? It is, it, is, it is an endless thing that is, without, that is fundamentally without purpose. All the purposes that exist in existence were put there, given there by living things, right? Um, purpose is always the purpose of someone, something. There is no cosmic purpose. Cosmically, there is just uh, uh, endlessly unfolding uh, uh, chaos. So there's the never a judgment the day. There's never a terminal. There's never an end of time. Yes, that's right. There's there. If there are judgment days in the plural, it's only days in which men pass judgments. They're not. There's no. Uh, there's no end of history. The closest thing that there is to an end of history, which is kind of his replacement for. Uh, 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 Hegel's absolute spirit coming to consciousness is what he calls uh, uh, the noon of Zarathustra, wh wh by which he means the time when people come to understand this as the nature of the whole, something like that, <laughs> right? Um, which is not, which is only a point in that cosmic process, but it's the point in that cosmic process in which that cosmic process is, is, is fully conscious of itself, right? Every single um, being who is a being has awareness of, uh, of, of this. Well, not every single being has awareness of this, but certainly uh, uh, Zarathustra or Nietzsche has awareness of this, and everyone who is uh, uh, enlightened by Nietzsche's philosophy has the uh, possibility of becoming aware of this, and if they've forgotten about it, it just means that uh, afternoon comes afternoon, and then, then night. <laughs> you can forget it, but it was true, right? And there was a moment when it was true, and he calls that moment noon, uh, which he calls end of the longest error. Um, but the only sense in which there's an absolute moment in the world process is the moment at which uh, the truth is understood. It doesn't change the world process. It's just a moment of self-consciousness within the world process. Um, OK. Uh, it's not something that is meant to be proven scientifically, et cetera. Yeah. Um, he says, life itself created the thought there's most burdens for life it wanted to surpass its greatest obstacle. Right, so the, 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 this is, again, quoting Nietzsche, the point, point of this is that uh, um, all of this is, um, uh, it has elements of self-conscious myth, it has elements of um, uh, willed for its, per, for its um, consequences. I want to I wanna contrast this, this is a little bit from outside the, our, our text, but uh, there's a, a section in uh, Second Untimely Meditation where um, 
uh, Nietzsche discusses uh, Eric Hartmann, who was a 19th century uh, uh, German philosopher of history post Hegel, um, who was a pessimist. He was like a, a Hegelian in his philosophy and a uh, Schopenhauerian pessimist in his morals and a nihilist as a result, right? He says, you know, uh, uh, everything that is doesn't deserve to exist, was Eric Hartmann's position. Um, and so he, he did want to have there be an end of history, but the end of history he, he, he was looking for was that uh, uh, at some determinate time in the future, uh, mankind would consciously decide that existence sucked and it shouldn't happen. <laughs> and, uh, and they would just all collectively commit suicide at the same time and get this consciousness thing to go away. Um, and uh, Nietzsche in the, in the second Italian meditation talks about this as being a joke philosophy. Um, He's being charitable in Hartman and seeing it as a joke. Um, Hartman was actually just incredibly pessimistic. Um, but uh, 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 yes, yeah, so uh, this is uh, it's the second untimely meditation. He's explaining um, uh, how Hartman sees the, uh, the day of judgment, redemption, right? Uh, what, what Hartman means by redemption is the, is the day of the collective suicide. Um, uh, Yes, grotesque mask. Um, uh, okay, if however the dis disgust should nevertheless come to power as you have prophecies to your readers, and if you're, this is Nietzsche by the way, and if your account of your, uh, of your present and future should turn out to be right, and no one who has despised them with such disgust as you have, that I am quite willing to vote with the majority in the form proposed by you that next Saturday night punctually at 12 o'clock the world shall perish and our decree shall conclude from tomorrow there shall be no more time and the newspaper shall appear no more. But perhaps our decree will have no effect. Right? <laughs> um, but the, the reason I'm pointing this out is um, uh, in his younger days, um, uh, Nietzsche is imbibing these philosophies of history post Hegel, including pessimistic ones inspired by Schopenhauer, that uh, uh, have notions of the world process as ending in a redemption, uh, and that redemption sometimes being a nihilistic redemption as a destruction, um, and uh, you know, as the the place where everyone can achieve the 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 the, the freeing from existence that of which the Buddhists dream, right? Uh, that 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 degree of nihilism, and he treated it as. Uh, a bad joke, right? Um, yeah, because yeah. He, he, although he was a Schopenhauerian pessimist in his youth, he still had enough connection to uh, life, optimism, etc., that the last thing he was going to do was uh, uh, agree to a pessimistic end of history, right? Um, so, so uh, and, and that's there when he's in his 20s. Um, but just to give you, it just helps to see an idea of the kinds of philosophies of history that were running around in the 19th century when he was, you know, writing all this stuff. So yes, he wants there to be no end of history, uh, no judgment day. Uh, 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 the the uh, he wants an, an eternally unfolding eternal world, not uh, one that ends uh, on a, on a Saturday when people decide they've had enough. Um. <laughs> um, okay, so that's. A bit on eternal return of the same. Um, I think we've covered most of the overman things, except for the most, the, the nastiest parts of it, which you might want to come back to. Um, well, maybe we should just go to the nastiest parts of it. Did anyone else notice the parts of the overman that were like um, uh, uh, kind of foreshadowing uh, the the, the uh, excesses of of the Nazi regime and and Germany in the in, in the time when, he, when when this was being written, both the stuff about uh, machines and the stuff about uh, uh, race. And there's, there's a bunch of things in here which are um, ways in which you can see that the, uh, uh, the Nazis were, might, have been, might have been superficially and misreading Nietzsche, but they were reading Nietzsche, right? Um, there's things which are uh, connected to the overman idea that are quite unsavory. Did anyone else pick up on that in this chapter? This is a part of the chapter that I couldn't quite get to, but uh, that was what I would have expected to find because that's what we've been told of for a few, my few decades of my learning about Nietzsche and the Overman, or the Superman, as I've heard it called more commonly. Yes, Uberman is the actual term. Um, but the, the uh, uh, what's going on here? The, what's going on here is, um, uh, uh, something like mankind viewed as mere raw material, right? 
Right. Um, that's that's Trotsky, however. Uh, as well, right? There's plenty of, uh, in the 20th century outside of Nietzsche, but uh, page 230, um, uh, he calls it nihilist. Uh, Heidegger calls it nihilistically inverted man is for the first time as a type. It is a matter of type. Humanity is merely, this is now Nietzsche, humanity is merely the experimental material, the vast surplus of botched specimism, specimisms, a field of ruins. The point being, as soon as uh, uh, consummate subjectivity regards all that is as a uh, human creation and work of art, um, uh, it also looks upon mankind as something to be shaped in the same way, mm -hmm. right? So a part of the overman idea is the idea that uh, what humanity shall be is not something that's going to be determined by mankind's nature or by any absolute standard of justice in the heavens, but is going to be the subject of conscious human creation, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the in the sake, and by the way, in the midst of a, dim, a struggle for dominion over the earth, so that the principle that's going to determine what man should be uh, will be something like what furthers power accumulation, right? So there's a a a, a power seeking willingness to view mankind as plastic raw material to be used for the for 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 practices of creation of power, and right after that he gives a. Uh, um, a quote from the machine as instructress, machine as instructress, which is like the most anti-individualist uh, passage you've ever read, right? The machine itself teaches the intermeshing of human groups and activities in which each one is merely one thing to do. It provides a model for party organizations and the conduct of war. On the other hand, it does not promote the self-glorification of individuals. From many parts, it makes one machine. Then out of every individual, it makes an instrument for one purpose. Its most universal effect is to teach the usefulness of centralization. So that's Nietzsche, right? This is the same guy who's telling you that we're going to have a struggle for dominion over the earth in which uh, um, we should uh, reshape man to what's good for power accumulation, right? Um, so this means that uh, party organizations, conduct of war, and uh, a... Uh, organicist structuring of uh, human society in a you know, totalizing top-down fashion, centralized fashion, is very much what he's talking about. He's not against all those things. He's not so much of an individualist or so much of a spiritualist that he's against all those things, right? And in a way, that's a, that's a, a necessary consequence of viewing everything that is as uh, a human creation and therefore viewing uh, uh, the future of the of mankind is something that you could write like a novel, right? Um, if if the future of mankind is to be written by uh, uh, conscious acts of legislation by men as a novel, then men become raw material for that uh, uh, for that process, right? I'm very I'm very mass, just comment. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea here that uh, he keeps sort of jumping, in my opinion. Because I can certainly agree that all that history, culture, all those things are made by men. They're made by humans. They're made, you know, and they're made in this yes. indirect fashion that uh, Hayek calls spontaneous order. Uh, yes. But I'm not sure how it fits in here. But for Nietzsche, he, he sort of, after he sort of starts with that idea, he sort of switches over to the idea of some centralizing concept that sort of sees all and sort of sets the uh, path and set, decides what the perfection should be and turns mankind or, or the other men. Or, or man. Uh, so, so, so you're right in the sense that um, he does uh, he, he does have room for something like a um, uh, uh, a, a a wiser uh, underlying in an organic process rather than a you know conscious centralized. Uh, but uh, uh, how to put it? Um, he thinks that that comes out precisely when uh, the uh, power political actors uh, fight with power politics against one another, right? That, that's the kind of uh, spontaneous order he's interested in. The spontaneous order that results after uh, ev every drive attempts to tyrannize in its own favor and its own spirit, right? Uh, that's what he sees as the spontaneous order that is the body. He calls the, 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 the body such a spontaneous order. But it's not a spontaneous order that results from uh, uh, the only subordination to the, to the common purpose is, is the one imposed by the by the higher parts of the hierarchy, right? So, um, yeah, you're, you're, there's there's almost none of the um, uh, I just put it this way the the, the delicatesse about uh, spontaneous order that you find in like uh, a Hayek or a Burke, 
There's not. Yeah, he's, he's got an optimistic point. He says that there's a stabil there's an equilibrium that's reached, stability. Other things do descend into chaos, uh, the war and stuff like that. But uh, it's possible for humans to sort of find, maybe through trial and error, a way that is stable and leads to something that we currently label human flourishing. Which right. Nietzsche, Nietzsche doesn't know anything about. He, he thinks he's just going well, to make it up. No, no. On the contrary, he he does think that there is a uh, there is such a struggle, and that it does lead to something which called which he would call human flourishing. But he thinks that the uh, 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 the modern age is precisely becoming more uh, rational because it is becoming more evil and more uh, open about how it is doing all that. Right. Um, I'm using evil in the old sense, obviously. Um, it's it's the uh, the age in which people frankly admit that the thing that matters to them is the, is power that you're finding honesty about these things, right? That's something like the claim, and that's also where you're getting um, uh, rational thinking about it. But the point that I'm making in the in highlighting these things about the Overman chapter is that there's no question that some of that can be very dangerous, right? Politically dangerous, right? Um, and and uh, uh, We've seen it. That's 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 the point that I'm making is that that's not a distortion of Nietzsche. That's there in Nietzsche, right? Um, yes, you can also see other things that are distortions in Nietzsche uh, in, in, in in later politics. But th there's there's enough that's actually there in Nietzsche that's uh, 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 it's capable of being dangerous in in part, in largest part, if you put it this way, simply because of the uh, attitude that man is viewed as a tool. Right, that man is. Uh, if I contrast it with Kant, you know, there, there, there's no notion of uh, uh, every rational being is an end in himself in Nietzsche. Right, on the contrary. Um, so, so uh, uh, right, uh, the advent of a doctrine that sists men out and that drives the weak to firm resolutions and the strong as well, etc. So, um, and he expects that to be a catastrophe. I mean, uh, Nietzsche famously prophecies that the 20th century will be the war, the era of world wars leading up to the dominion of the earth, and those wars will be conducted in the name of fundamental philosophical doctrines. Well, that's end, true, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and by the end of the, the essay, uh, Heidegger says, you know, that's no longer a prophecy. It's, you know, it's, it's now, you know, what we see all around us, right? Yes. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is that in all of this, all of these less savory aspects of the Overman doctrine, Heidegger is being expository rather than he's not particularly endorsing this. These are these are mm -hmm. all things which, uh, uh, in his as we saw at the end of the earlier sections of Volume Three, um, uh, he's denouncing a bunch of it as consummate subjectivity and as uh, 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 oblivion of being and as uh, uh, you know uh, in questions or new technology he says something like. Uh, Man comes to the very brink of a precipitous fall, the time when he becomes raw material himself, right? So th there's definitely aspects of um, Heidegger that are, one, aware of these aspects in Nietzsche, and two, quite critical of them. Do you think um, any, was there any element of self-censorship here, given that where he was working and what he, whom he was working with, and who his students were? So uh, definitely, but also an attempt to uh, uh, steer or enlighten in to, to some degree, right? where he could. Uh, you see that especially at the end of the section six where he uh, is trying to say that Nietzsche's metaphysics as core is never specifically German philosophy, it is European uh -huh. and global, yeah. right? right? So right. there's places where you can see he definitely wants to take on this or that, you know, current doctrine of the regime that he thinks of as, as, as distorted or dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, all of that, it must be said, not because he, Heidegger, was in favor of uh, uh, universal ethics, uh, uh, modern uh, principles of democracy, uh, 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 Kantian morals, you know, there, there's no sign of that, right? The, the, the criticisms he has of the uh, Nietzschean uh, uh, subjectivism are that it's a, a typical modern subjectivism and that it has forgotten being and has, you know, they're all very philosophical criticisms of it. They're not that it's not liberal enough. It's, they're not that it's, you know, uh, 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 so, my point is that he, he, he does see danger in these things, but he tends to think of that in a uh, conservative, uh, 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 spiritualist manner, right? It's like the, it's mm. like the kind, kind of objections that someone uh, 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 might have to this as being godless, right? Uh, uh, too, too, too modern secularizing uh, uh, or something like that. But um, uh, it's just that the, uh, God being introduced as something like the uh, the, the 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 
injunction to uh, take care of the truth of being instead of uh, uh, something else. Um, but anyway, I wanted to point out both that those elements are there in Nietzsche that Heidegger does bring them out. Um, uh, he does have objections to them, but those objections are not the objections that a sort of typical uh, uh, modern liberal would have to them. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in terms of Heidegger, uh, from our point of view, there's actually something to condemn him. Uh, in, so at uh, page 231, uh, the paragraph at the top, the last sentence is, that is to say, the principle is metaphysically necessary. Sorry, second to last sentence. Yep. And then the last sentence, just as Nietzsche's thought of will to power was ontological rather than biological, even more his racial thought metaphysical rather than biological in meaning. Mm -hmm. and here, Heidegger is directing a criticism at the regime saying, uh, you're treating people biologically like you're saying, well, the Jews are bad and they're Jews if one of their grandparents was Jewish. Mm -hmm biologically, whereas uh, Heidegger is not without his criticism of Jews or Christians or communists or what have you, uh, Heidegger's uh, criticism is metaphysical, that so, the oh, cultures have the wrong understanding of being, so, not that biologically bad. So I'm going to partly agree with you and partly disagree with you with that because he, here he is trying to, uh, 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 if I can put it this way, criticize the crudity of the regime compared to a, uh, a German idealistic understanding of this, right? Um, he's still saying that the metaphysical German idealistic understanding of this would be racist, so to speak, um, but it would be uh, uh, re regarding that as a, as a creation and a myth rather than as a uh, uh, scientific fact to be ascertained or something. Um, but all of that is still descriptive of Nietzsche. And when Heidegger says that something is metaphysical, he's not endorsing it. He's enough of a critic of metaphysics as a structure and the thoughts to which he gives rise that calling something metaphysical is not praise in Heidegger's terms, right? Well, that, um, that, that's true, but his criticism of Christianity, communism, Judaism. Sure. You get the metaphysics wrong. Uh, sure. Um, uh, but, you know, from his point of view, uh, this, is, this is not a, uh, um, how to put this, uh, so did everybody else, right? <laughs> yeah, since, the, since the early Greeks and except himself, right? So I, I agree with you that he's not defending those things. Uh, he doesn't have the standards of those things. He has his own criticisms of those things. But, but here, when he's uh, when he's trying to uh, 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 move Nietzsche's thought on the subject up to a metaphysical plane, uh, that's not a uh, supporting of it or an endorsement of it. He, he, his his uh, diagnosis of all of Nietzsche's thought on a metaphysical plane is that uh, it is the consummation of metaphysics, which is something to get beyond, um, in large part because it is so anthropomorphic, and in large part because that anthropomorphism winds up reducing man to raw material instead of being a shepherd of being. Right, and all of that you find even more so in the question concerning technology. Um, and but uh, all of that is a is a single consistent um, critique of the dehumanizing aspects of the metaphysical understanding in Nietzsche. And he he is thinking that all of modern metaphysics has some element of that in it. He thinks that Nietzsche is the consummation of that or the worst offender in that regard. Um, but uh, uh, he's not doing all. He's not. Uh, praising Nietzsche by calling him metaphysical is what I'm trying to say. Um, the other thing I, I, I want to note in the Overman chapter is, is that uh, he talks about the, the change from, uh, from Hegel, right? This is on page two, 225. Um, only its inversion of the subjectivity of willpower exhausts the final essential possibility of being a subjectivity. By the same token, representative reason is acknowledged in it through the transformation of value of thinking, but only in order to be placed at the service of an empowering of overpowering. With the inversion of subjectivity, uh, of absolute representation to the subjectivity of will to power, the preeminence of reason as a guideline and tribunal for the projection of beings topples. So the, the point there is that even within metaphysics, the specific difference of Nietzsche's metaphysics compared to Hegelian metaphysics beforehand 
is that Nietzsche has overthrown reason, right? Um, and, and, and that is, uh, then he you know, says, that is what gives rise to the essential necessity of the overman, right? So the, 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 the same inversion there, he is, he's, he is tagging Nietzsche not just as an example of metaphysics, but as the example of the consummate metaphysics, the consummately subjective metaphysics in which uh, reason has been over, as a tribunal has been overthrown. Right, and I put it to you that is also not praise, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, but anyway, that that that's this, that, that such things are there in Nietzsche is uh, is 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 recognized by by Heidegger. Um, okay, uh, I want to get to the justice chapter, right? So, um, in particular, there's. Uh, three moments of the justice chapter that uh, I want to talk about. The, fir the first is uh, there's just like the picture. Hold on one second. Um, this is the part I was waiting for you to comment on. I had a question specifically okay. about Go. what Back you just mentioned. Me. I'm glad you did. So uh, this is actually stemmed from page 223. And then of course it keeps going when um, yeah. he's discussing Hegel's phenomenology yes. and he gets into the, the discussion of categories. How yes. I was going to ask was, do you think that Nietzsche ever actually escapes categories as well? I'm not sure of that because so, as I kept reading, I'm like, I'm not sure he really gets, does, so, I'm not sure he does so a good job not, of escaping he's not, it. He's, he's not trying to escape categories, but he is, uh, uh, he is trying to view uh, categorical thinking from a fundamentally practical, not theoretical lens, right? Um, to, to, to Nietzsche, categorical thinking is the way we have to think in order to tame chaos. Right, um, and he's not trying to get outside of that. He's just trying to recognize that it is a chaos teeming tactic, rather than a uh, uh, eternal truth about the nature of the whole, something like that. Right. So uh, uh, Hegel thinks that when we arrive at the categories, we're finding the permanent structural bones of reality. Right that all things must fall into these categories and have to be thought of in these categories, not, not just that they're thought of categorically or with categorical thinking, but these specific categories, right, are the, are the eternal basic bones of reality. H Hegel thinks that is a discoverable fact about the world, right? And, and to Nietzsche, uh, all of that is placed in the, uh, in the uh, hypothetical brackets of by this person at this time for these purposes, right? So that conceptual thinking is always a tool, right? Uh, he's not, he's, he doesn't think, Nietzsche does not think that there is a, any possible thinking which is not conceptual, right? Thinking is conceptual, but um, thinking itself is uh, a, a means and a function of the, of the whole embodied organism for Nietzsche, right? So that's the only sense in which he is, he's not even get out, getting outside of conceptual thinking. He's just uh, viewing conceptual thinking itself in a, uh, in a constrained way, expecting less of it, especially, expecting, especially as expecting something less um, objective and eternal from it um, than, than, than a Hegel would or a, or a, uh, or a Aristotle would. Um, right, so in this, uh, uh, this, this paragraph, though, I want to talk about it for just a second because some of it is about technical things in Hegel, which are quite difficult. This is a paragraph on 223 beginning with phenomenology in Hegel's sense. One, one of the things that's going on here is that um, uh, Heidegger is trying to differentiate phenomenology in Hegel's sense from phenomenology in his own sense, right? Um, that is, that's his own method. Um, phenomenology in Hegel's sense is beings bringing itself to concept as absolute self appearing. Your phenomenology does not mean a particular thinker's way of thinking, but the manner in which absolute subjectivity as absolute self-appearing representation or thinking is itself the being of all beings. So the, the, the point in the phenomenology of spirit, which is the book he's talking about here, especially, um, is that uh, uh, this is meant to be um, uh, thought thinking itself in some like Aristotelian sense of this is how thought appears to itself, right? And phenomenology is, uh, is uh, trying to follow that using the clues of subjective reflection, but those clues of subjective reflection are only the raw material for the thinking about what uh, uh, subjective reflection tells us, right? 
That's the, that's the, the method in the phenomenology of spirit, right? That the immediate contents of your consciousness are just the data about which you reason um, in, in, in the dialectical reason of the, of the phenomenology, right? So, um, but that thinking about the contents of consciousness dialectically is the self appearing of reason to itself, um, at least in, in intention. That's what Hegel intends it to be. Um, and, and Heidegger is differentiating that in its full meaning to Hegel from something like uh, what you have in Husserl or in himself. Um, there, there's no, that's not quite true. There, there is a notion in which what Hegel is talking about is a way in which the human mind has access to being or something like being, but only because this is the being of thought appearing to itself and um, all being is thought to Hegel. <laughs> Um, if you're a, if you're a Hegelian theist, it's thoughts of God. If you're not, it's, uh, uh, thoughts of the, uh, of the world spirit, but, uh, or the transcendental spirit, but, um, it's all thought, right? Um, but only in that sense, is it, uh, a mode of access to being, whereas something like Husserl thinks of, uh, constant of consciousness as, uh, having intended things outside the mind, um, it's a different notion of phenomenology, um. I, I just want to bring up that contrast, not because it was your, the point you were asking up, it's just, it's in that paragraph and it's easy to, um, Hegel's concept of phenomenology is already subtle enough, right? And so to, to, to realize that this is exactly the same word is used for Heidegger's own method in, in things like uh, being in time, um, but doesn't mean the same thing at all, <laughs> is, uh, uh, can easily be confusing. Um, were there other questions you had about the Overman chapter, Jim? I think you already got to all of them. I had other okay. things highlighted, but you've, you've done a pretty good uh, job of getting through them. That was okay. the only only part that you didn't cover. So I was like, yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, we'll come back to the find animal. Uh, I want to get to the three sections of the justice chapter. So um, the, the first part is kind of a recapitulation of things we've seen before, but it might be new for some of you. Um, this is on the uh, relationship between uh, uh, truth, art, and justice as like three tiers above each other. And then there's a, you know, a recapitulation of what he means by justice as having these three moments of um, uh, construction, uh, exclusion, and annihilation. Um, uh, that's all, in a way, the, the, um, the part which is expository of Nietzsche's view, and it's the way in which he's trying to show, um, uh, uh, he's trying to show uh, a notion of justice as, as a nature of truth that is meant to fit into his structure of metaphysics uh, concept. The, the, the third part um, is kind of a summing up of all of this, the whole six part essay. In between, there's a, a very fleeting section where he's uh, trying to explain how um, Nietzsche's notice, notion of justice fulfills the notion of being an essence of truth position. Um, and this is about the letting appear of truth. Um, and it's, it's the easiest to miss but to me, it's the, it's the specifically Heideggerian note in all this. It's the place where he's not just explaining something from Nietzsche, but he's trying to substantiate the claim that Nietzsche has to fill out something that's in the structure of metaphysics. Um, what page is this? So, good question. Uh, uh, where is it? Yes, okay, uh, 243 near the bottom, I believe. Thank you. Um, where he's talking about, uh, okay, so he first of all explains uh, 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 justice as pinnacle, positive zone conditions. His, his point is that this notion of justice is the self-appearing of will to power to itself, something like that. Uh, will to power empowers itself to its, to its own essence by positive viewpoints and conditions. In that way, it brings what is firmly fixed and what becomes in their twofold shining to appearance in a unity. Uh, uh, we'll talk about what that means by that in just a second, but, but by letting beings appear in this way, will to power brings itself to appearance as what most intimately is this empowering letting appear and the twofold radiance of refulgence and illusion. The essence of truth that all metaphysics assumes and preserves, even if it is still in total oblivion, is a letting appear. It is the revealing of what is concealed, it is unconcealment. Thus, justice, because it is the supreme motive of power, is the proper ground for the termination of the essence of truth. 
So first of all, this is the answer to the question people had of, you know, why is he bringing up this just thing in the first place? But this is also um, the, 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 the moment of the structure of metaphysics in Heidegger's own understanding. That he thinks every successive metaphysical doctrine in the history of Western metaphysics has, right? They all have some way in which they are um, an essence of truth as a letting appear of what that metaphysical doctrine claims is the truth about beings as such and as a whole, right? All of them are trying to be in some way an uncovering of what is, and all of them have a moment where they uh, uh, are meant to be something like the self-appearing uh, of uh, the truth of beings, right? And what he claims is that uh, the way in which justice does that for Nietzsche is uh, justice is something like the self-understanding and appearing to itself of will to power that is conscious that it is will to power, right? Um, and Nietzsche might agree with all of that, but not see as being anything essential about it being an appearing or a, uh, 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 a letting appear in that. But to Heidegger, it's essential that that's the letting appear. Um, this gets back to the question of, is there something uh, uh, in some outside sense true uh, uh, about this or a notion of truth that it is needing to conform to even if that's not Nietzsche's conscious doctrine of truth, right? Um, Heidegger is claiming that everything that is, uh, uh, every metaphysics, because it's talking about being, is trying to be an unveiling of what is. And there will come a moment, whatever it says the being of beings is, there will come a moment where it has to explain to you how uh, being not only is this way, but being, being appears to itself this way. There has to be an appearing to man in which this nature of being appears to man. And the structure in that is not Nietzsche's structure. It's a structure of metaphysics that Heidegger is explaining. Right, and that Heidegger is going to look through even. Um, there, there's a way in which uh, man as the understander of being that you found in being in time is a doctrine that Heidegger thinks is true and binding on all these metaphysical thinkers, even if it's not part of their doctrine of truth, right? Uh, the fact that they're trying to explain the being of beings to people uh, already requires them to be about um, a bringing to appearance, a letting appear, a revealing. There's that notion of truth is unconcealment that they, whether they like it or not, must comply with to be a metaphysical doctrine, uh, to be coherent. Um, okay, in order to think justice, essence of justice accord with this metaphysics, we must exclude all notions, or ordinary notions of justice, right? Uh, fine. Um, but that, that moment uh, on page 243 is in a way the most Heideggerian moment of the whole essay, right? It's the place where he's trying to say, not only does Nietzsche's doctrine fulfill this metaphysical structure, but it also um, points to what to me Heidegger is most missing in metaphysics as such, which is paying conscious attention to the fact that all understanding of being is a letting appear, right? And the contrast with uh, uh, Nietzsche here is that um, to Heidegger, uh, metaphysics is not a human construct, right? This is you see on page 249, right? Um, uh, after a bunch of questions, you know, he, he puts some imaginary objections to what he has done so far into the minds of a, of a mouth of a student and, and tries to answer them. But he says, um, what can be said about this can only be expressed by way of opposition as, as follows. Metaphysics is not a human artifact. If that is why they must be thinkers, thinkers in each case frequently suited to the unconcealment that being, the being of beings prepares for them. So, Whereas Nietzsche is claiming in his subjectivist way that all of our conceptual understandings of the world are our own artifacts that we have created, that we've thrown over things. Uh, Heidegger is here saying, um, the fact that human beings try to understand being and respond to the claims of being and uh, think in these structures, right, is not something they made. It's not a, a, a Nietzschean morality uh, that somebody projected for the purposes of this or that, right? 
Um, in that sense, he does not think of metaphysics as being a uh, perspectival poem of, of human consciousness, a la you know, a Nietzschean morality. Um, and his evidence for this is that every metaphysics, despite all of their entirely different understandings of the essence of truth, all are trying to be a letting appear of being. So there's, there's some standard that they are uh, all conforming to, even when they don't acknowledge it. Um, a standard that, from Heidegger's point of view, is coming from being itself, or maybe from, from an old Greek thought about being itself, um, at least somewhere in between those two. Okay, so th that to me is one of the most striking things in, in six. Um, but the, the uh, there's also, you know, the, the last thing, there's a section at the end, which is uh, 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 almost asking the question of who, who's, who's going to be Nietzschean in the modern world um, and this struggle of fundamental philosophical doctrines. Uh, and then he ends on the note of uh, claiming that Nietzsche's metaphysics is coming out of this whole tradition of uh, European thought since Descartes. It's a culmination of modern metaphysics. In that way, it is European and global, not German, right? And that's a, a dig at the people around him who are claiming that it's a particularly German way of thinking. Um, okay. Uh, these fundamental metaphysical philosophical doctrines, I think it's fair to say that the fundamental philosophical doctrines that Nietzsche was thinking of when he wrote those lines were more like the ones we actually fought world wars over and less like the ones that Heidegger is thinking of because Heidegger is thinking more like, uh, yes, there's the fundamental metaphysical doctrine of Hegel, or it's slightly inverted form in, in, in Marx, and of there's a fundamental metaphysical position of uh, Nietzsche, and maybe one or two early modern others. Um, and those are the ones, uh, uh, the fundamental philosophical doctrines carrying on the war for dominion of the earth. But there's another one, which is his own, right? Uh, remember back in in uh, in uh, part two, um, he when he was talking about uh, how meaninglessness has now attained power, um, he said that the uh, after the struggle over meaninglessness, there will be uh, a, a a bigger question, which is the question of being, right? His own question. So he he imagine he 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 effectively imagines that the philosophical doctrines. Uh, the metaphysical doctrines will fight for dominion over the earth. And then once one of them wins and they're done, then the real event will uh, uh, begin of uh, the debate between himself and that position, right? You cannot possibly get more grandiose. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so um, I wanted to just point out that framing in terms of, uh, I mean, that, that uh, historical positioning of himself. Right, so he has an historical positioning of himself that's in an opposition to Nietzsche and all of modernity. Um, that sees Nietzsche as a as the consummate subjectivity of modernity, the hyper modern thing. Um, uh, but the uh, uh, war for dominion over the earth that Nietzsche discusses and is a uh, a player within, right, is not for. Heidegger, the main event. It's only the it's only the uh, precursor to the main event. The main event main event for him is not the political struggle, but the philosophical question, and which is the uh, you know the question he raised at the end of uh, uh, part one, right of volume three. You know, that's all very nice. We've explained Nietzsche's doctrine, but is it true? Um, he doesn't think that it is. Um, so, how does Heidegger? Uh, my, how does Heidegger? And maybe this was revealed by the end of the book. How does Heidegger escape that? Nietzsche would have said, "That's your will to power," trying to say that you've got this new thing that you're going to explain to everybody yes. beyond metaphysics. Yes, you know. I, well, it it it, 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 hey. it it certainly is, and it's and and every totalizing philosophy has explanations for everyone else, right? So you know, every every uh, every Humean can 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 put Nietzsche in in their own box and and Heidegger in their own box, and Nietzsche can certainly put Heidegger in his own in, in his own box for him. Um, uh, I I don't think that. Uh, Heidegger would even particularly object to some of those characterizations, but uh, that is that Nietzsche might make of him, of his will to power or something. Um, 
but Heidegger thinks that his desire to let beings be is a different thing. Um, he thinks that the, uh, the, 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 I guess the term for it is something like releasement, but uh, he, he thinks that uh, 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 releasement is not grasping um, and letting beings be is not trying to conquer them in representation in order to secure them for the exploitation of calculative reason, right? So um, uh, there's a sense, in a sense, there's a kind of theoretical quietude in, in, in Heidegger that is particularly resistant to that particular charge. Um, maybe for that reason, um, because it's uh, coming immediately after Nietzsche. So it's trying to not be so Nietzschean. So it may have an in indebtedness to what came before it. Um, but uh, uh, it is certainly the case that each of these philosophies can diagnose each of its successors, not just its predecessors. Um, and we'll have a way to ticket and sort the way in which they're wrong or the way in which they're deluding themselves or a way in which they don't actually supersede me. Um, uh, that's almost par for the course, right? This, any, any systematic philosophy has, a, has a, a place for most, if not all, previous thought and plenty of later thought. Um, right, but, uh, so Heidegger makes an ontological move, which is new, and so, in a sense, there's been these different uh, groups in history that have said, um, you know, this is what's meaningful. It's the will or it's the grace of God or it's just, we're just victims of nature. Uh, and Heidegger says, and this is his use of the word phenomenology. Uh, all of these are uh, phenomenologies in the sense that they attribute meaning to the things they find present before them. And phenomenology to Heidegger is uh, the meaningfulness of things uh, to Dasein, uh, an extension of Husserl's uh, lived experience. And so Heidegger is saying, yeah, they're all out there. And even Heidegger himself might have his own phenomenology where certain things are more meaningful to him as a Bavarian peasant than they are to some cosmopolitan Berliner. Uh, but Heidegger's move is to ask, what are the conditions that make all those different phenomenologies possible? What are the ontological structures uh, that make phenomenology possible at all? And so it, it's not gonna come up with an answer that answers Hegel and answers Nietzsche and answers the church. Uh, in the sense that those different people or institutions uh, were grappling for power or what is, what is the meaning of life or what have you. Heidegger's just saying what I'm interested in is what makes all those possible and what are the ontological structures that make it possible to then have uh, different uh, meanings and different epistemologies and different value systems. Uh, so that's kind of Heidegger's unique move that the others haven't made before. So, so I mostly agree with that. I'll just say that that move is in a way parallel to the Kantian move of the uh, conditions of possibility of the understanding. Um, it's kind of recapitulating that ground that is kind of indebted to that uh, tradition. Um, the other thing is that the particularly ontological questions in it is also not entirely new, right? I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's got plenty of Greek predecessors. It also has plenty of predecessors in the uh, scholastics, right? The, 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 the meaning of being question was, you know, the live debate between Aquinas and Scotus and so forth. And uh, it's not true that no one had thought about it before that, right? Um, so the, the ontological um, if not move, the ontological problematic has been there in, 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 in previous philosophies and the, uh, and the condition of possibilities 
uh, finding the structures, uh, underlying structures move is, is, is the staple of Con the Kantian Copernican revolution, et cetera. The actual phenomenological method is, you know, coming from Husserl, right? So there, there's ways in which he is indebted to and is synthetic of all of these different traditions. Um, so uh, that doesn't mean he's not original in either the uh, uh, use he's making of them or the places he's taking all of them. But uh, I'm just saying that uh, none of those particular individual things are unprecedented, right? Um, the thing which is kind of unprecedented in uh, Heidegger is a new notion of history. Um, there's plenty of notions of history before him, but his his notion of um, uh, I can put it this way: um, thought, action, and history, um, something like that, is very distinctively uh, his own. Right? There's there's a sense in which the uh, uh, the history of thought, which is uh, a terrain. Uh, that share, shared by many of these, right, is viewed in an entirely different way by him because he is so, uh, I can put it this way, um, phenomenologically individualist or existentially individualist, right? Uh, he's got tons riding on how this thinker responds to the questions of his time, right? And in, in terms of how he, individual thinker, thinks. Um, uh, there is a historical freightedness of that in, in, in Heidegger that you, the closest you get, it would be something like um, Kierkegaardian understanding of personal action or something like that. Um, and, and to me, that's the most distinctive thing in Heidegger. Some of these others are less. I, I wanted to jump in, uh, that was a good comment though. I want to jump in on the, um, uh, a couple of things in the justice chapter that we kind of passed over. One is this uh, later extremely influential notion of ontotheology which I want to make sure people see in passing and understand because um, uh, it has quite a career after uh, Heidegger. Um, but there's also the, 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 the discussion of, um, uh, over this way, the, the role he sees of the uh, com com coming out of uh, uh, church understanding before then. So this is basically from the bottom of page uh, 239 where he talks about the uh, Liberation to a new freedom as an escape from the Christian church's assurance of redemptive redemption based on belief in revelation. Um, there's that whole section. And then there's um, over on 241, um, uh, what he's calling the new lawfulness. Um, the new age for the first time exalts itself as complete control of its own essence. He's talking about now um, the Nietzschean inversion of Hegel, right? What proceeds is foreplay. Consequently, up to the time of Hegel, Modern metaphysics remains the interpretations of beings as such, remains ontology, the logos of which is experienced in a Christian theological way as creative reason grounded in absolute spirit. And then just the parenthetical comment, onto theology. Um, and then the remainder of the paragraph is, you know, um, uh, making claims about Christianity. But the this 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 is an incredibly um, uh, concentrated notion. Right, what's going on here? Right, that uh, moder he's saying uh, uh, metaphysics to Hegel, but not including Nietzsche, is ontotheology, which he means ont by which he means uh, ontology or explanation of beings, the logos of which is experienced in the Christian theological way as creative reason grounded in absolute spirit. So, uh, what does he mean by uh, the Christian theological way? Creative reason. The, 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 the claim is that all of these uh, uh, attempts in modern subjective philosophies to view uh, reality as the uh, uh, created, projected uh, thing of the mind, right? To view, to view the external reality as being something which was created by the mind and projected onto it, and that as being the, the, the essential thing there. The claim is that that is indebted to the notion, uh, the Christian notion of creation, as the uh, all the particulars are the creatures of the creator, right? And what has happened is the notion that uh, uh, being minus God is creation. It is the set of the created things. Everything is viewed as a created thing and everything is viewed as receiving its essence and essential form from whatever mind created it is 
there in all of the modern philosophy from Descartes to Hegel, right? And that's the structure he's calling ontotheology, by which he means <clears throat> that there's something like a, a logos as creative reason that is making the entities by thinking them in the traditional uh, um, uh, scholastic view, right? In the, in the view of someone like uh, Meister Eckhart or Don Sc uh, or Scotus or something, uh, or even Scottish uh, Regea, right? You, you, you get these notions of uh, the beings are the thoughts of God, right? They are, they are the, the, the creations of the divine reason. And the modern uh, subjective philosophies are trying to think the thoughts of God and thinking them in the same way that the beings are the thoughts of that thinking thing. That thinking thing is now something more like the transcendental ego or consciousness as such or absolute spirit, all of those, all of which are words for the same thinking creator that made the creations, right? So the, the idea of um, ontotheology is the idea of the being of the beings is the uh, creative, creatively, re, creative, reasonably created um, uh, uh, creations of a, a divine-like creator. And that divine-like creator has taken the place of the Christian God. Um, and its, its, its theological aspect is that it is, the, it is responsible for the being of the beings by having created them, right? So we see this in all the modern no notions that yeah, we know only what we make in, in, in Hobbes or uh, uh, all, all the notions of the, um, uh, the synthetic uh, uh, actions of the understanding and projecting the meaning of beings in, in, in Kant, uh, the absolute spirit uh, in, in, in Hegel uh, of us uh, encountering uh, 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 objective things as the, our rational thoughts and things. All of those are... Um, ways of seeing thought-likeness, createdness, uh, uh, and having an origin in a creative reason as equivalent, right? Some creative reason makes, uh, makes the world. And, and the, to, to highlight that concept and to tag it as being a fundamentally Christian theological concept, right, is Heidegger, right? I don't think people before Heidegger saw that or made that claim. And that notion, of uh, ontotheology as this way in which uh, modern philosophies since Descartes are a kind of secularized Christian thinking, are a kind of, um, in, in a way, indebted to, uh, uh, to, to, to Christian theological thinking, um, has a great career after Heidegger, if I can put it that way. Um, it is, a, it is a, um, something you will hear on the lips of many a postmodern. Um, that they will detect onto theology in a certain doctrine, and what they mean by that is that they see the same uh, uh, that 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 same structure in understanding things as as creatures this way. The way in which this survives in even Nietzsche, who has gotten away from the absolute spirit notion of that, is Nietzsche is also thinking of um, even moralities and philosophies as human creations, right? And he has a notion of uh, justice, which is along the lines of the creator should rule the created, um, which isn't obviously just, but that's the notion he has. The, so, um, and that comes from uh, what he sometimes calls, Nietzsche sometimes calls thinking, uh, thinking backwards or uh, 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 thinking uh, in value terms. You ask of any uh, structure uh, how it governs men's conduct, what, what's its you know, value for that rather than uh, its content. Um, but this means that you're, both viewing things as creations and you're, you're valuing those creations based upon how they change conduct, something like that. Um, okay, what am I getting at here? There, there's a, there's a, uh, a diagnosis of all of modern philosophy uh, from Descartes on and maybe to include uh, uh, Nietzsche with this extension uh, that views um, the fundamental character of all existing things is that they are produced, that they are made, right? Um, and so you trace their essence back to their efficient cause and their purpose uh, that was put into them by their um, divine or less than divine creator, right? 
but divine or less than, than divine, you view everything as a, as, as a creature and as a creature of its maker. Uh, in the case of Nietzsche, uh, even a creature of, their, uh, of the maker's uh, uh, needs, passions, drives, whatever. Um, okay, so I, 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 I sort of have a slightly different story on this that uh, maybe is a little easier to follow and Go for it. Uh, it doesn't start with the Cartesian reinterpretation of scholastic metaphysics, uh, but goes back to the Greeks, and it has to do with Aristotle's uh, prime cause. And so there's a notion in theology of, uh, you know, something is caused by the thing before it, Mm -hmm. that ultimately goes back to God creating the cosmos. And also in physics, we have the notion of, well, this thing has a certain velocity. Why does it have that velocity? Oh, some force was applied to it in the past. And we can go back and see what caused that force all the way to the Big Bang, which uh, set the whole thing in motion. And today, physicists talk about a block universe where it's all mapped out from the beginning to the end. It's an automated uh, process. And that, to me, is the uh, other explanation of ontotheology, is you go back to this notion Aristotle had of everything had a prime cause. And ontotheology is an explanation for everything out there that goes back to the prime cause, whether it's science or whether it's God. The so, creative so I, and I, I, I had one, one more thing. And so this is Heidegger's move is that we're born, we're thrown into the world, we're we're always going to have incomplete knowledge because we're going to die. We're finite mm -hmm. beings. And so we'll never know the prime cause of everything, even if technically, physically, there was a first force that pushed other things that cascaded to what we have today. We as Dasein, finding ourselves thrown into the world, we're going to have to make decisions even though we don't have a full understanding of the causes of things. So ontotheology is insufficient for our purposes because we wake up thrown into the world. We don't wake up with a user manual explaining everything that came before us. Sure. I mean, I, I, I get that, but I mean, the, 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 so the, the, the prime cause, first cause aspect is not simply the made or created aspect because uh, the made or created aspect comes in later, honestly. It, it's, it's where it specifically becomes, you know, a, a, uh, a post-Christian thought, so to speak. You, you have first cause thinking back in Aristotle, for example, without having, uh, w w even in a universe that's eternal. Um, but yeah. the, the, uh, uh, the, the, other place to realize this the first cause stuff the first cause thoughts and the being thoughts and the necessary being question and the highest good question all of that was the the prime subject matter of both platonism neoplatonism and most much of medieval philosophy right um and in in that whole uh nexus of questions the question of being the question of the first cause the questions of necessary existence and the question of god were all the same question right um so uh the sense in which doctrines of being and doctrines of God were, the, were part of the same question goes back to the scholastics and it goes back to the notion of necessary being. Um, and necessary being is not simply first cause. It can be first cause and you can have first cause in a purely a temporal sense of first and you could also have first cause in an ontological support sense of first of you know what, what, uh, what layer is it in the structure of reality, right? And these are distinguished carefully by the scholastics and the, you know, the Aquinians and the Scotians disagree with each other on which of these things is controlling for the first cause argument and so on, right? There's, there's a whole, whole subject matter back there is what I'm trying to say. Um, but the, the, 
the 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 thing which is noticeable about, about this citation of it is that he's not primarily talking about um, temporal first cause, and he also makes no mention whatsoever of necessary being, right? Which is sort of the two, um, uh, if I can put it this way, the two Aquinian and Scotian uh, things you might think of as the, the core sort of ontotheologically thoughts. Instead, it's just the maidenness of things. It's just the fact that things are creatures, right? Um, uh, experience in a uh, theological way is creative reason grounded in absolute spirit. So uh, the fact that he's extending that all the way to Hegel, Hegel is not making a first cause argument. Hegel is not making a, you know, tracing things back to their origins uh, uh, argument. Um, uh, he's, he's trying to understand the uh, uh, phenomenology of the contents of consciousness uh, that we're thrown into in much the same way that uh, 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 Heidegger uh, starts, right? So, uh, but still, in Hegel, you're going to arrive at the conclusion that everything that is is, the crea is, a, is a created thing made by absolute spirit. And that's why Heidegger is calling it ontotheology. It's not because of a prior cause or first cause argument in Hegel. There isn't any. It's because it's viewed as a creation of spirit. So the idea that there is something like a uh, creative reason or cre or, or um, uh, that beings can be thought of as um, congealed thought, right? Something like that. Um, that's what he's calling the particularly ontotheological um, uh, tendency is even the right term. Um, what he's diagnosing as ontotheology is precisely the view, viewing things as, viewing the beings as uh, something like the, the, the thoughts of, of God, right? And, and that's, a, that's a notion which was characteristic of uh, medieval mysticism more than anything else, but it also goes back to- uh, it, it, it comes from Islam. So before we get to the scholastic, you go through all these ten and sure. the uh, uh, Certainly it's there, it's, it's there, it's there, in, it, it's, it's there in the, in, in, I was about to say, it's there because it's also in the, uh, in the Neoplatonists, which is where a lot of- You're right, but, this, but so with Islam, uh, it doesn't have to become a historical thing. God could be imagining it right now. Sure. Created this history for you to make sense of the past, but maybe he just created it a minute ago. Right, well, that's something you find in like Asherite theology, right? Um, uh, uh, you find the same thing, by the way, in, in William Wacom, who's kind of like the same thing in the West. Um, uh, but uh, if, if anyone is interested in, in like a deeper dive on those things and their connection to being, I can recommend a, a book called uh, Being and Some Philosophers by uh, Gilson. Um, definitely worth reading. Maybe I'll do it sometime in the future. But, um, uh, and it includes all the, the different takes that the, uh, both the um, uh, Platonists, Neoplatonists, Aristotelians, uh, medieval Aristotelians, medieval Islamic uh, thinkers, et cetera, all had on this stuff. But, yeah, no, um, I, I get your point that I, I was emphasizing the prior um, in a temporal the sense, creator yeah. Creator too much. I was just using that as a way to think about onto theology that uh, beyond just from Descartes onwards. Right. Um, I mean, it definitely goes back before Descartes. I definitely agree with that. I, the, the point that I'm going to try to make is that. Um, people after Heidegger were influenced by his diagnosis of this concept, right? People after Heidegger take this concept from Heidegger and run with it. Um, and they, they, they apply it to things in modern philosophy that uh, uh, he might have applied it to, to, uh, and to other things as well. They do the same thing with metaphysics and the idea of something being post-metaphysics as well, but a different story. But uh, you have to, I wanted to flag this because this is, this is a place where this concept has an afterlife outside of Hegel, Hegel's, outside of Heidegger's philosophy, including among people who uh, don't, you know, follow, believe, even understand Heidegger's philosophy in other respects, but for whom this uh, uh, th this concept as something which is happening in the history of Western thought is uh, of intense interest and use to them, if I can put it that way. Um, okay. Uh, Right. 
Okay. Uh, were there other questions? We, we, have we answered your questions, Joe, about justice and why he's on about justice, or is it still mysterious to you that he calls this justice in the first place? No, it, no, it is much clarified. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, much clarified. So uh, I now want to just throw the floor open to questions about any of the pieces. I've gone through the, the, the sections I wanted to go over, um, but uh, uh, sorry, there's also a bunch of chat questions. What was that, uh, that book you said, that other author? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, Being and Some Philosophers. <coughs> Etienne Gilson, you can't probably have it reversed. Um, Gilson, Gilson, okay. G G I L S O N. Um, I would call him a uh, an Aquinian, um, but uh, so being in some philosophers. Yes. Instead of being in time, or you know, it's just being in some philosophers, right? So he's gonna. The sections are being in the one, being a substance, essence and existence, existence versus being, being in existence, knowledge in existence. Um, so it gives you an idea of the subject matter. But he's going to start from Plato and then the Neoplatonists and the Aristotelians, and he's going to go through um, uh, different takes on being and existence or essence and existence um, uh, down to modern times, right? Um, and Unsurprisingly, he's going to, you know, break a lance for uh, thinking that Aquinas had a good take on the on the on the problem, right? Um, but along the way, he's going to uh, give you a, a pretty good explanation of um, where these different philosophical schools were on the on the question of what is uh, meant by being in existence. Um, and all of this is a a useful background to know, sort of the the, the depth of all that discussion, debate, problematic, well before Heidegger, right? Heidegger didn't invent mm -hmm. the question of being, right? He ha certainly has his own take on the question of being, but uh, it's, a, it's a traditional problem, if I can put it that way. Um, and knowing the prehistory of that traditional problem is, is definitely useful for understanding his own take on it. Mm -hmm. um, so Gilson is just a good guide to all that because he, he knows the, the ancients and the scholastics so well. Um, Uh, I want to get the distinctions between Wittgenstein's, the case, and all of the chapter's ideas of it. Ah, is this just totally nice? Thing? Okay, so you're, I think I take that question, I'm looking at uh, Joe, your comment in the chat, and um, uh, I'm taking you're reacting to some of the things I, uh, I put in to answer Steve's questions online. Um, yes, yes. Uh, where I, uh, I was trying to talk about what uh, adding the true of something adds to a, a thought in, in Heidegger, right? So um, I was explaining that uh, metaphysics is supposed to be the truth of beings as such and as a whole, and I was trying to explain what the, what the portion of the, of the formula truth of does to the rest of the formula, right? There are some philosophers for whom truth of X and X are synonymous. You know, wherever you have X or truth of X, you can replace one, of, one with the other. Heidegger is mm -hmm. not one of those people. Right, Heidegger thinks that the truth of X, the truth of X is different from X. The truth of something modifies that something or tells you something more about it, right? Um, and I, I said to speak Wittgenstein because in, in thinking particularly of the of the uh, Tractatus, uh, uh, he starts off famously with you know um, the world consists of facts. You know the facts are all the things which are the case, right? Um, that's uh, the, the sort of typical Wittgensteinian pos you know early logical positivism view, right? Um, the everything which is the case is one version of what some people would mean by truth. It's not Heidegger's. Mm -hmm. For Heidegger, the notion of truth includes the notion of appearing. It includes the, 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 the something like discovery or appearing to a mind or being thought, not just thinkable. So whereas, whereas for Wittgenstein, the truth of X would be something like, what is the case about X? To Heidegger, the truth of X is something more like, what is revealed or thought or appears in consciousness about X. Mm -hmm. uh, truth includes the notion of appearing, being thought, occurring in consciousness to Heidegger in a way that it doesn't for a Wittgensteinian, right? Wittgenstein so tends to be more of an object, 
uh, objects, subject object person, and Heidegger wants to sort of bring it all back and put it inside subject. So, 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 uh, complicated for Wittgenstein. He is a subject object person, but fundamentally, the positivist means that he's thinking of th truths as positive from the standpoint of. Heidegger, he's thinking of representational thinking and reality as coinciding. So from the standpoint of Heidegger, uh, Wittgenstein is a, a typical modern who thinks that the world of representation and the world of posited facts and the world of facts are the same thing and are the world. Now, the slight twiddle on that is that Wittgenstein has enough of a mystical uh, semi-Kierkegaardian moment to him that he sometimes acknowledges that uh, all of that is only what's knowable about the world and the world might be bigger than what's knowable about it. It's sort of a Kantian <laughs> thing in itself way, right? Um, and, and seriously, this is, this is like a reservation that Wittgenstein will make towards the uh, claim that everything is representation, right? Um, but especially the early Wittgenstein, insofar as things are thinkable, they are basically just the content of representation, which is just things posited, right? So from Heidegger's point of view, that's you know straight Cartesian uh, modernism. Um, so uh, Wittgenstein may think that he is being incredibly objective about all that. From Heidegger's point of view, he's not be, I mean, he is yes thinking entirely in terms of the subject-object uh, uh, distinction, um, but the subject is as least as much a necessary pole of the subject-object distinction as the object is, and yeah. um, uh, all of these thoughts that. Uh, uh, um, Wittgenstein is writing down in the Tractatus. Um, he is a human being writing them down, uh, and they are uh, representations as thoughts in his mind um, is the status that they actually have. Yeah, well, of course, I've never read Wittgenstein, and uh, when I was uh, first encountering this whole idea, I was reading Being in Time. Okay, so. yeah. Yeah, no, he, uh, being in time is very different from the, from the Tractatus, right? The Tractatus is a typical work of, you know, uh, positivist uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon philosophy, I can put it that way. Um, now, the later Wittgenstein is a little bit more slippery on this stuff because he, he like Heidegger, has um, uh, notions of how much language can and cannot say about things which are, right? And so both of them have this... Uh, um, uh, they share an appreciation for how thinking depends upon language, if I can put it that way. Yeah, um, but, I've agreed on that myself. But uh, uh, Wittgenstein's understanding of how language works is fundamentally way more mechanical than Heidegger's, <laughs> and way less right. poetic. Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's much more like how logical systems manage to signify than it is like uh, uh, how uh, Resonances in words uh, manage to elicit uh, uh, intuitive understandings of external realities. Um, uh, anyway, that's just. The, this was all triggered by the comment on the uh, on the website um, in answer to Steve's question, where I was contrasting uh, the Wittgensteinian notion of that which is the case as one notion of truth with Heidegger's notion. For Heidegger, truth always includes. Um, uncovering, unveilingness, appearing to a mind, um, has to get into consciousness somehow before there's a truth of, truth of it. Um, X and the truth of X are, are two different things because the truth of X is always thought and X might not be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of see Wittgenstein and Heidegger as uh, akin in their, uh, what they're trying to, what motivates them uh and uh I, I see wittgenstein as more germanic but completely taken up by the anglo philosophical world but he writes in german up until the end uh the philosophical investigations sure. are still in german even though he's been a don at cambridge for two decades sure at that point, he can't think directly in English. You know? <laughs> and what I think Wittgenstein is doing is exhausting what logic and truth as representation can tell us to see what's left over. And there's so some truth to that. Yeah. And in the track, 
he says, you know, I've done all this. And then there's this other stuff that you just can't say anything about because logic or right. what I laid out in the previous 100 and whatever paragraphs it is, can't say anything about that. And in the phys- philosophical investigations, he's on the same similar track to Turing where they're trying to exhaust what is everything that can be automated? What are all the thought processes, all the games that can get automated away so then what's left is human thinking? Right. And so the, and, and the thought behind that is that if, it, if it's a matter of syntax, then a machine can do it and it doesn't count as thinking, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, so I if I would... Look- but I, I want to. I want to hang on. I want to jump in here for a second. So uh, the the contrast I would make is that at least the Tractatus era Wittgenstein um, it uh, likes to say that uh, of, of which uh, of that that of which you cannot uh, speak thereof you must remain silent. Right. Uh, he- Heidegger uh, is very voluble in that silence. Right. He. Uh, right. He, he he, Heidegger is Heidegger is endlessly talking about the things of which, according to uh, uh, Wittgenstein, one cannot speak. Um, and, 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 and that's their difference in style. Uh, I don't think that's just a difference in style. Sorry. Uh, well, I don't think that's just a difference in style. Uh, Wittgenstein is trying to exhaust everything you can say with analytically yes. to look at the leftover while Heidegger's looking directly at that stuff that the analytic. Yes. Say yes, but the difference between them is precisely that Heidegger doesn't think that it's not possible to speak of those things if you can't speak of them rigorously. He thinks that speaking and speaking and thinking and rigorous logic are so non-coinciding that uh, it is simply not the case that uh, that of which you cannot speak with complete logical precision, you cannot speak, right? Yeah. He thinks you. that's almost what speaking is, is to speak of that which you cannot speak with logical precision. Um, Okay, but fair. There's, uh, hopefully, that was a useful contrast. Um, uh, 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 a few quick a few quick tur- a few a few's queer turning. What? Uh, Joe Cobb. Uh, after the Wittgenstein was the first cousin of Hayek, you say Wittgenstein a few's queer turning. Oh, oh. Uh- <laughs> Sorry, that's supposed to be agrees with Turing. Ah, oh, yeah, I think I, I can't. I can't read that small not, type, and when I type this in, I've missed it. I understand. I can't correct it. Sorry. I understand. Uh, not quite, but I mean, yeah, there's. I don't want to get into Turing, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> too too big a topic to raise this late in the day. So, so um, I want to give other people a chance to jump in with their questions about the the, the reading. Steve, I'm good. Been very okay. helpful. Okay, James, Jim. I pretty much got uh, all my questions answered and um, then some. So, uh, yeah, I can always comment for a week, but I don't think it's what you're asking for. So okay. I'm good. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, Rui, do you have any questions you want to ask if you're listening to all this? I don't have a question, but it's a very good um, chance for me to learn because everything the names the philosophers or those philosophies are pretty new for me so uh-huh. every time you mention a word if i don't know i need to google that because <laughs> uh-huh. in my school back in china i come from china we taught this in chinese in mandarin so i need to translate into the chinese name and so i can like remind me some of those things i learned back in school yes yeah, yeah, so can you get english language books yes i can this book by, um, they just mentioned Gelson might be interesting background. Gelson? Yeah. Uh, okay. This is, this is uh, one of the books I was mentioning. Uh, the it's... Thing and Some Philosophers? Exactly, yes. Okay. Yeah. We might, we, might ma- we might manage to do that sometime next year or something. It's a, it's a doable thing in five sessions, maybe. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Brent, any questions? Yes, a very interesting uh, discussion. I appreciate it. Um, I have a bunch of questions, actually, but I'm not going to help. Um, maybe just throw out one uh, okay. among the many. 
I wrote down here, but um, so the, the switch you meant from the categorical, the categorical switch from the theoretical to the more practical emphasis yes. or perspective, um, that seems like it would entail an emphasis on politics as opposed to philosophy. Is that a concomitant effect? Um, uh, not in Nietzsche himself, because he has such a dim view of politics, um, maybe in some of the successors. Um, uh, uh, from Nietzsche's point of view, the important action is what we would tend to think of as the philosophical, religious, uh, thinking, poet, poetic um, uh, action, artistic action even, um, rather than political action. And he has, he has an extremely dim view of what states can do. Um, uh, he calls the state the coldest of cold monsters and so forth. Um, this is especially true in the younger Nietzsche. Um, uh, so there certainly are people who went that way with Nietzsche afterwards, um, and including in, in people who postmoderns and so forth, um, but not in Nietzsche himself. And it's just because he he himself had a uh, an extremely um, cynical view of politics and political action as being a um, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, a kind of fallen thing, a, a, a kind of hopeless thing. Um, partly that was a, a sense of um, part of his condemnation of the modern world specifically, um, but it, it's also just um, his reaction to um, what he sees around him in Germany in the, in the 19th century. Um, you know, he, he grew up in the era of the worship of Bismarck and, uh, and, and German unification and so forth, and his very first published works are um, taking the piss out of the uh, self-congratulatory nature of German nationalism at the time. Um, uh, basically trying to say, you know, you've exalted yourselves as uh, uh, having all the answers to these things, and I look at you and I see your uh, the standards of thought and uh, uh, poetry and creative uh, uh, activity. Um, uh, you're um, not impressing me, is, to, is, to, is the, the not, the least that can be said. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's just Nietzsche himself has a dim view of politics. It, uh, it could easily have been taken in that direction, but it wasn't by him, him himself. Does that help? Um, yeah, and uh, Heidegger, does he have any thoughts on that? Uh, ex you know, ex extremely down on politics compared to, philosoph to, to philosophy. Um, so, you know, it's surprising to me. It seems like it would be a natural, well, he you know, upshot or implication. He well, Heidegger himself is not uh, signing off on that reorientation in Nietzsche. He's, you know, somewhat critical of that reorientation in Nietzsche, but um, uh, oh. so he's not just following Nietzsche. Heidegger is not a Nietzsche in, in, in all things, um, but uh, in, in that one, he certainly isn't. Um, but uh, uh, there definitely are people who have taken the uh, that re reorientation in that direction, and the, you get the postmodernists who say all is po all, all is political. You even find that in American pragmatists who have the same kind of attitude. Um, thinking of people like Rorty um, these days, or Dewey in, in the progressive era, right? Who had the same reorientation towards practice and and uh, and uh, thought of politics as more important as a result. Um, but uh, a lot of these uh, people think of, they've learned even from people like Nietzsche that uh, politics is downstream of culture, right? And culture is, uh, uh, culture and moralities and philosophies are uh, simply seen as the, um, the far more important uh, positions or fulcrums uh, in history. Um, so from a, a long enough historical view, the, um, the actions of thinkers and 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 writers and uh, religions and poets are way more important than the actions of uh, politicians. Uh, there's a there's a famous uh, line in uh, uh, Heinrich Hein in the early 19th century, um, uh, uh, at, um, who says that Robespierre is but the bloody hand of Jean Jacques Rousseau, and that uh, uh, the, the the men of action just uh, play out a hundred years later what the men of thought have already uh, declared that they they should do. Um, and that is sort of the common understanding of people in this set, um, that uh, e everything immediately political was shallow and ephemeral uh, compared to um, uh, 
the sort of longer term spiritual action of changes in thought. And that's Don the same, same kind of thought you hear these days in popular culture as, you know, politics is downstream of culture. In 1920, as early as 1920, uh, an English dilettante named John Maynard Keynes wrote a very well received book in which he said that uh, uh, almost everything in the modern world that practical businessmen believe they're doing out of, out of practical reasons is the uh, you know spooky ideas of some dead economist. <laughs> and I've right. often found that to be quite wise, yeah. very wise observation. Yeah, the other, the other thought there is uh, people say that uh, any degree of disorder in the minds of the Dons shows up in, in, in the rest of the world in 50 to 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, fair question, but that's the general take these guys have on it. Um, all right, um, we seem to have exhausted the immediate questions. Steve, any others we didn't get to? You've, exha you've exhausted me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, good. You've once again driven me back to, to say I should read this from the beginning. Okay, uh, what so about that, what about that analysis chapter that we have skipped? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not reading the stuff from the uh, from the secondaries uh, people. I, I uh, if you want to afterwards, you can go back and read them. I, I find them mostly pretty shallow compared to the Heidegger and Nietzsche themselves. So right, not right. not worth all of our time. I mean, if you want to read it on your own, fine. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I want them to edit it and translate it well and, uh, you know, give me occasional footnotes if they're going to, you know, make a decision about how to translate something, but I don't particularly want them to stand between me and the text. <laughs> um, but uh, so I just want to uh, re recap with what we're going to be doing uh, next. Um, so we're, we're, we're starting volume four for next time. Um, this, uh, in, in the pagations of this book, it's, the pages go to like 288 and then they start over again at one, which is very confusing. Um, but in, in the beginning of volume four, right, uh, starting with the five major uh, rubrics of uh, Nietzsche's thought, that's where, we, where we'll be starting and we'll be going until page 57, the nihilism as history chapter. That's the first nine chapters of, of part one of volume four. And you um, said August 16th? The date is August 16th, uh, 1, 1 p.m. Uh, West, U.S. West Coast or Phoenix time. Um, uh, that is the same time as this one, but uh, a month from now, basically, on August 16th. Um, that's about 60 pages. I should just give you a little bit of um, preview of what the topic is, right? The, the fundamental topic of this whole section is European nihilism, what we mean by nihilism, um, and uh, 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 why does Nietzsche make this such a concept? What, what, what is its role in all of his uh, thought? Uh, what is, how is it related to value thinking? Um, where does nihilism come from? Um, and uh, 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 just sort of Nietzsche's view of history as the history of the West as the history of, uh, of nihilism arriving. Um, that's like the first nine chapters and that's why I picked that stuff as the, as the, um, the first section. The next section we're going to do after that is going to be 10 to 14, which takes us through um, uh, evaluation, subjectivity, and uh, uh, morality, and culminates in anthropomorphism and Protagoras, the saying of Protagoras that man is the measure of all things, of things of things that are that they are, and of things that are not that they are not. Um, that's going to be the uh, used to explicate what Nietzsche is saying here and to um, uh, maybe contrast Nietzsche's version of that with the Greek version of that. But there's an elements of Nietzsche's thought, which are similar to things you find in, in the Greeks of uh, Heraclitus on the one hand and Protagoras on the other. Uh, Protagoras has this man-centered uh, to be is to be perceivable, uh, as well as this um, uh, kind of uh, classical relativism, uh, all things you find in Nietzsche. And uh, Heraclitus has the same focus on becoming and uh, tension between opposites and so forth. Um, so Heraclitus and Protagoras are kind of the Greeks closest to uh, uh, Nietzsche. Um, but anyway, that, that's this, the second section. The third section um, is going to be all about um, Descartes. So the contrast between Nietzsche and Descartes. Um, uh, yeah, and the last one, I don't know if we'll do it at one or two, but it covers the end of metaphysics, the relationship of Nietzsche to Plato, Platonism, uh, all that stuff. Um, and the other thing I'll just say about this whole section that 
differentiates volume four from volume three is that in volume four, we're going to get a kind of running commentary of Heidegger's own view on these things, as opposed to just explication of Nietzsche's views. Volume, volume three was fundamentally more explica uh, you know, uh, explication of Nietzsche's position, and you heard occasional notes of Heidegger's own position, but it wasn't kind of a drumbeat. It wasn't a con constant counterpoint. In volume four, we're going to get a constant counterpoint of what Heidegger thinks himself on all these questions. Right? There'll still be places where he's expository and he's just explaining what Nietzsche thinks, but you can't come away with volume four uh, without realizing that Nietzsche and Heidegger disagree on many important points, right? Because all of, all the ways in which he disagree are gonna start coming to the fore in volume four. Um, so um, that's gonna be the, the characteristic difference of four versus three, if I can put it that way. Um, okay. Uh, Thanks very much for joining us. I uh, hope it was helpful, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much, Jason. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Jason. It's wonderful. Okay. And you say you've recorded it? I have recorded it. I'll see about you know where it goes and if I can put it up somewhere on the website or something. Um, but uh, it's the first time, so I don't know if it worked, but we'll see. I'll try. Uh, just, just let me know, because it would be fun to have, um, see, everything we went through today, uh, my mind operates sort of like a stroboscope, I, I'm sorry <laughs> to say. And uh, so I'd like, I like to always go through, uh, my grades in graduate school dramatically improved when I started tape recording my lectures and then listening to them again the fun that night. But, and looking I got at you. Notes. If I manage to, if I manage to record it correctly and manage to uh, uh, put it up on the website, I'll let you know and I'll put it up on the website. And if I don't manage to put it up on the website, I'll uh, at, at least mail it around to people who attend it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, okay. everybody. Take care. Cool. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And where is my stop recording button? There it is. Okay. <laughs>